is uh, 12th march and uh, dr d dialan the former director of archaeological survey of india is going to chair this session and you all aware of his uh, academic work and administrative abilities and i on behalf of you i request uh, dr dialan to take the chair and conduct the proceedings thank you very much good morning to all um i'm happy to um congratulate uh, the organizers and also they have given me this opportunity i am very much thankful to them and there are three or four speaker in this uh, session uh, one is uh, mr umar khan he is already on the online online and he is going to present on the online and uh, actually uh, umar khan is a multi specialist Could you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, actually, he grown up in Vienna, that is Austria, and also Islamabad in Pakistan. Actually, you are a multinational person. <laughs> It's very interesting to have uh, such a multinational person with us, and he's basically a photographer and also very much interested in archaeology. Basically, he has taken a lot of interest and he has made a lot of collection, particularly stamps and the historical photography. of the areas heritage buildings and umar khan book from kashmir to kabul the photography of john burki and william burke is uh, 19 1860 and 900 this is one of the very remarkable one which gives uh, the photograph which was taken by the earlier scholars and he has compiled that one and he has made a very good uh, presentation of that one like that there are many other even the postcard of the rajas uh, particularly the rajasthan area and uh, Uh, some of the areas which is in the uh, the rajputana area that is another work uh, which has been very remarkable of his contribution and uh, he has also done uh, the ancient indus valley civilization in collaboration with the leading archaeologists since 1995 and he is currently a chief technical officer at uh, common sense media in san francisco usa so i welcome uh, the uh, the speaker uh, to deliver his uh, presentation Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I take it everyone can hear me just fine. I'm uh, honored to be here from San Francisco and speak to you all. My talk is really about the very first excavations at Harappa uh, in in Pakistan in southern Punjab, which were made in 1921 by Daya Ram Sani. Sani of the Archaeological Survey of India, India, and what we're doing, myself and Dr. Nadim Zubair in the UK, is going through all the earliest excavation images at Harappa, starting from 1921 through 1940, and putting them all up on the web so anybody can look at them, and then trying to associate the original text in most cases. by the indian archaeologists who excavated at the site with those images so with that in mind let me just uh, open my presentation and share my screen for a moment and go through and share some of those images with you so just a moment of background uh, harappa.com the website i started uh, in 1995 it's like it's hard to believe that it. it's been so many years uh, we get about 5000 people a day about 60% from india and then from the uk the us pakistan and believe it or not brazil uh and we have thousands of pages up there of the leading scholars work articles papers slide shows and everything and our goal is to really help to let the whole world understand more about the ancient indus valley civilization which still remains very much an unknown civilization uh to many of us uh I'm very pleased to say that uh I met Mr. Mahadevan in Chennai in 1998 and did a very nice long interview with him a very fine afternoon spent at his house. Uh he was a truly remarkable man and I'm honored to speak here uh, in his memory. Uh his interview with him that I made that day is up on the website. In fact, I recently had it retranscribed and we put the whole interview up uh, uh, before Excuse me Mr. Into... Umar Khan could you yes. hear me now? Yes, no, I can hear it you. Put it in a full screen because we are only getting the slide show. Oh, put oh. it in a full screen. Sorry, let me just 
Is this full screen? Sorry about that. Hi, thank you. Is this thank full screen? You okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so and we have many of his articles and and early stuff uh, that we presented uh, from those days. So I, it's uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be up here, and I always had such enormous affection for Mr. Mahadevan because of his deep intelligence and amazing contributions to studying the Indus script. And I found him to be somebody who always thought very deeply and was very open to many different ways of thinking about things. So let me just, when we launched this site about the very first excavations of the 1921 season at Harappa, we, that was in November, but in the weeks beforehand, we tried to look at the very earliest times that Harappa had been mentioned by various British people who had passed through, including at the bottom left, uh, General Cunningham, who was the first, the founder actually of the ASI, the Archaeological Survey of India, and Mr. Burns on the right, Masson. It was about a hundred years where you had different archeologists mention this big site, these mounds in Harappa. Cunningham actually excavated in the early 1870s. Uh, and there were a number of seals discovered unicorn seals, which I show in the middle of this pane, and they really had mystified uh, the British archeologists and they didn't know what was going on. And they said, this was writing they had not seen anywhere in India before. They couldn't understand what the unicorn symbol was. So they knew that something was up and that there was a gap missing in history, but they couldn't know uh, what that actually gap uh, represented. So this is a view of Mount F at Harappa. And this is probably December, 1920. Uh, when Sani first came upon the site. Now he had been sent there uh, by uh, John Marshall, who was the DG of the ASI, who had seen the seals before he had come out to India in the early 1900s. And he had tried in many different ways to send people to the site over time. And this is what is known as Mound F, the granary at the very earliest stage. And I'm gonna show you now an image of the same, roughly the same uh, sort of scene shot today. This is looking towards the working men's platforms, which you might be able to see uh, up there to the right uh, on Mount F. So this is what the site looks like today. But let's go back to 1921. January to February 1921, six weeks, the very first season at Harappa. And our goal really has been to take these images and try and put them back in the sequence that they actually were shot by the archeologists on the site uh, with their photographers. And this is Mount AB at Harappa. So Mount AB and Mount F were the two mounds that were excavated at the very beginning uh, by, by Dayaram Sani, who had come out there uh, at the behest of the ASI. And he had in 1917 visited and realized that there was probably something really interesting and worthwhile here. So he had spent about two and a half thousand rupees to buy the sites uh, from the owners who were still, you know, obviously had it. And by buying the sites, he was then able to begin the excavations. So this is uh, Daya Ramsani on the left, and then the next to him is John Marshall. And I know there's been a lot of criticism of Marshall and, and, and so forth, but if you go through the papers and look at it, uh, certainly the work was done by the Indian archeologists, but behind the scenes, someone like Marshall did a lot to get the funding together to do these kinds of excavations. In fact, the work at Harappa should have started even earlier, but World War I intervened. There were a lot of funding cutbacks. The ASI had to give up a lot of money. And Marshall was always fighting to get money so that he was able to fund these people and actually make these kinds of excavations happen. And one thing to notice that someone like uh, Daya Ramsani and the earliest Indian archeologists who were involved in the work uh, in the Indus Valley and elsewhere uh, in the subcontinent. These were really intelligent and bright people. I mean, Sani was a gold medalist in Sanskrit. Uh, he was in Punjab University, he was uh, you know, from Lahore originally. And even the other archeologists who actually ended up getting slots in the very few positions that there were with the ASI in those days, uh, they were very bright people and it really shows in their work. So I'm, one of the things we've tried to do is as we have taken these photographs, and most of these photographs are either with the ASI or they're locked up in archives uh, you know, in Pakistan. And we're gonna try and do the same thing with Mohanjadaro because the Sindh archives there have the earliest images of Mohanjadaro from the earliest excavations in the 1920s as well. We wanna associate the image and the original text. And I'm very happy and grateful to the ASI for actually putting all of these original texts up on archive.org where anybody can download them and read them. 
And this was one of Marshall's big contributions actually to archeology span was to have all of these texts written and to have the archeologists make these reports as annual reports. And then on the right, you have Butts's, uh, MS Butts wrote the actual book on the excavations at Harappa in 1940 after he took over the excavations and put all the information together. So we've tried to associate their work with uh, the images that were shot at the right time, so you really can understand things in context. And it's very interesting, as you will see, to actually have the Indian archaeologists who are on the site talk about things. And as a quick aside, another fine text up there, by the way, uh, is this book, by the, this sort of compilation lectures uh, given in Chennai in 1935 uh, by K. N. Dixit, another later on. Uh, he was also the DG of the ASI. After Sani, he was the uh, second Indian DG. And this is an excellent book, by the way. Even though it was written in the 1930s, uh, it really is very topical today. And you'll see how much less, uh, how much we don't know that much more in a way. We can't say that much more with absolute certainty about the Indus people and, and, and the script and so forth than even what Dick Shit uh, talked about then. But coming back to the images, what we've done is we've taken these images in the, in the earliest way. So at the very left and the top, you will see the very first excavation trenches uh, dug in Mount F in, the, in, the, in what is now the granary. We have the map on the right from Butts' uh, book in 1940. That little area circled is actually the part that you see. And then at the bottom, you see an earthen chati, a big kind of jar that was found there. And, and, and then some actually one of those pieces that you see tumblers on the right was found inside the jar. And on the left, we've put actually Sani's commentary. We have Butts' commentary. I think we have uh, Nian Jod Lahiri has some commentary as well. And then in all cases, we've had Dr. Mark Kinoyer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison give a modern commentary uh, to the situation and what else has been learned and give his uh, thoughts about uh, what was written in those days and the image as well. As you know, he's been excavating at Harappa for 20 or 30 years now. So this is the very first trenches being cut into Mound AB. Believe it or not, we actually don't know who the gentleman is standing at the top left looking over uh, the workman. Uh, it might be it might be uh, Sani, but we're not quite sure his physique isn't right. And we have so few photographs uh, and so few biographical details about some of these people that there's still a lot of reconstruction and work to be done. But as you will see, people in those days didn't excavate the way people do today at the site of Harappa, power, as people do in Tamil Nadu with you know, grid lines and actual very careful measurement of where items are found and so forth. They sort of jumped right in and uh, took out as much earth as they possibly could to find things. So of course, Sani was delighted in those six weeks in January, February of 1921 to find some more unicorn seals uh, with similar writing and and different symbols than had been uh, found before. So that really made him feel that, oh yes, the seals that Cunningham and others had found at the site were not accidental. Here we were dealing with something very novel and different. And then just to show you how you know, difficult it is in a way, in these early excavation photographs, this for these are two seedlings of unicorns. Uh, these are actually labeled in the Punjab volume number 26. They were somehow in a folder dated from 1917 to 1920. We have not found the original seals for these. We don't know where they are. They were not included in Sani's later writing, but the picture is of the seedlings that were struck from the seals are actually here. So my guess is maybe they were sealing, seals found in the 1917 visit, uh, but then he would have talked about them. So we still have to sort of track things down. So in many ways, uh, Drs. Baer and myself were kind of like detectives trying to put together the earliest archaeological work, trying to do an archaeology of the archaeologists. And one of the most interesting things about, you know, Sani and, and Butz's writing as well is the way they immediately identified the objects that they found as things that they were familiar with. So Sani immediately labeled the two objects on the left and the right as lotas, which, you know, hold water. And in the middle, he called it a, a martaban, which was the English word that they used uh, to de designate something that actually with a storage jar for pickles. So the, the, the great thing about these archaeologists is that many of the things that they took out of the earth were instantly familiar to them could be a lingam, it could be something else. These, these were not things like you often find with Western archeologists who don't really have a word for what they see. They don't understand quite how something that they find might fit into their culture. So at the very bottom are actually the pointed 
you know, vase goblets uh, on the left and the right at the top in Sani's picture. These are modern, uh, I mean, th these are uh, modern discovered goblets in, in color uh, by the Harpa Archaeological Research Project. We still don't quite know what these objects were used for. They were probably ritual objects uh, and held in a certain way and perhaps done uh, for very special occasions, but they're still quite actually unknown uh, to us today. Uh, here is another very interesting image uh, from Sandy. He immediately identified on the left and the right the two, uh, the two you know, pottery vessels as ink pots. And he said these were being used by maktabs today in the even region, and they were used to dip ink into write. Now, we cannot be sure about this. Uh, we, you know, we have not yet found anything that people have actually written on it. Such, you know, paper uh, would obviously, if they used paper, would not survive. Palm leaf is something that they more likely could have used in those days to write longer texts. But again, none of those have survived, so we can't be sure. And it's interesting that on the left, uh, the, the C2 thing actually has three holes in it, which uh, Sani thought was used to hold something around somebody's neck so they could walk around and write. Uh, you know, Mark Kinnor thinks that more likely that this is something that was used uh, for some very special you know, liquid or dye or perfume or something uh, to be held, but we're not sure. We actually, this is again, something that we still, uh, still need to uh, sort of understand better. Then the other thing that Sani found very, the very beginning on the site was a lot of female figurines. And he noted a couple of them on the left. I'm showing you one discovered you know, in color on the right by the Harpa Archaeological Research Project. Now these are of course, were quickly identified as mother goddesses by a number of the archaeologists and, and Marshall and others, but you know, people today, uh, Shireen Ratnagar and others, uh, as, as other archaeologists too, have suspected they may be votive offerings. They were not made that nicely. Uh, they could have been used in households to, you know, for, for, you know, for some kind of uh, ritual use and may not have been mother goddesses. We actually don't even really know. These are two of the things that really jumped out at Sani and he called them, he thought they were made of clay and they were actually bluish, beautiful bangles. Uh, they actually are made of, of fans. Uh, which is, you know, heated steatite to a very high temperature and then glazed uh, blue-green. These are very beautiful objects, uh, but they also gave him a sense that this was really a major site and some, you know, very interesting things going on. Uh, there are also one of the things that I think uh, Sani found too were a lot of toys, like these carts. Uh, the A233 was actually found in the large earthen chati that I showed you in the very first slide. Uh, I think it's a sign that a civilization is extremely uh, sophisticated if they have a lot of toys, like the Indus people seem to have. They really took care of their children. And you can imagine that children who had a lot of variety of things to play with, or you just developed a certain level of intelligence and culture. And I think you can see this in a number of uh, sort of Indus cities. Then there were the ring stones. When, when uh, Cunningham had been there, he had made a diagram of this Nogaza thumb ring. So at the very top of Mount AB, still today, is the big uh, sort of a mazar of a pier, a man that people in tradition say was nine yards long. And these sort of ring stones lying around, uh, and the, on the left are the two actual ring stones that are still sitting there, were thought of to be his thumb rings. Uh, so a miniature thumb ring, or miniature ring stone, was discovered by Sani uh, right there at the site as well. And that also puzzled him. And these ring stones, by the way, uh, you know, Harappa, like Raki Gari, is a site which is still a living site. You have a mound where people are living today. And on that site, actually underneath houses, people have found these giant ring stones as well. So they obviously were a very important part. They may have had some temple or ritual uh, type co connotation. We're not 100% sure. They were also found this very interesting ball on the left, A174, which is pierced holes. No other such ball has been found in the entire site of Harappa. And Dr. Kenor doesn't quite know uh, what it was used for. In the middle is the flint core. On the right is a small little ball, which again, may have been used as a toy. And then, uh, so there were only six weeks of excavation there. Sani also had this picture taken, uh, which is sort of mound E looking towards look in the distance, you'll see Mount AB. And what I wanted to show with this image is how much tunneling on Mount E, this is a different mound now, it's been named Mount E, how much the brick robbers had taken over the years and the local people had taken the bricks to actually build their houses today and use them for other purposes. So this is a site that actually has been completely ruined 
in the 1850s uh, in a way by the British who took the bricks to build the, as you may know, the uh, Lahore to Multan Railway, 100 miles of you know, railway ballast was taken from, you know, it was built by bricks from Harappa. So tremendous destruction of the site happened, yet still we have found so many interesting things. And I would say less than 10% of the site of Harappa has actually been excavated. Uh, as you know, excavations are very expensive and very difficult to do. So there's a lot more to be learned from this site as from Mohanjadaro and many of the sites in India and the new sites that have been discovered as well as of course, uh, places in Tamil Nadu where I know people are excavating today. So there's a long story still to be told here. Uh, so what happened after these 1921 excavations where there was no excavations the next year, again, the money was not available. In 1923, 24, we still did not know that this was the ancient Indus civilization. Sani went back to the site. We think this is an image from 23, 24. This might be Sani standing here right in the middle. That little tomb, that Mazar of this Nalgaza is up there on the right. And this is some more of the excavations there. But after 20, uh, after 20, uh, 22, 23, 23, 24, we still were not sure about the Indus civilization, but it actually was MS, uh, it, it was, uh, it was Bats who excavated Mohanjadaro, who really started piecing together the fact that there were such similarities and seals in both of these cities. And then Banerjee had been excavating at Mohanjadaro. Bats put together the information, got it to Marshall. And then in September 1924, Marshall wrote that article in the Illustrated London News, which announced the quote discovery of the ancient Indus civilization. You can see the fine speeds up at the uh, bracelets that I talked about the bangles at the uh, top right and then other scenes uh, from Mohanjadaro there and the similarity of objects and this ability to suddenly realize that there was this whole enormous civilization in India that nobody had known about. And it was actually, it was a little bit jumping the gun uh, to publish all of this stuff, but it was good because two weeks later, uh, there was a British archeologist who had been in Mesopotamia and said, oh my goodness, we found those same unicorn seals at the level around 2300 BC at the excavations there. So that was for the first time the ability to really date the ancient Indus civilization to that you know, third millennium. And that actually pushed back, as you know, ancient Indian history by about 2000 years. So just to give you very quickly some of the images uh, that we still have to work with. Uh, so we've just done the very first season. We're going through each season carefully putting together the text you can see on the website 1921, Dr. Zubair is working on the following seasons. This is uh, actually a snake on the right and then a, a shell ladle uh, on the left that were found in 1924, 25. After this announcement of the discovery of the ancient in the civilization, tons of money flowed to the ASI because there was so much excitement about the fact that a new civilization had been discovered, all of Marshall's problems getting money uh, after World War I and so forth suddenly went away and the government of India committed large sums to actually for at least a couple of years, do some serious excavations, both at Harappa and uh, Mohanjadaro, which is where we discovered many of the things that we've learned about today, uh, at least for a couple of years. And then Marshall went down there himself to do excavations. Uh, this is further excavations in Mount F. Uh, the Sani and the other archeologists, uh, it was then I, I think at this point, Butts was actually excavating, they all, talked about this as the parallel walls area. They didn't use the word granary yet. They just called it the parallel walls area because they were so fascinated by a place where you had such straight walls and this sort of open sort of air gap uh, between them, which we still don't actually know what the granary was used for. Likely was not a granary. Uh, in fact, I think the research to date suggests, uh, you know, with Mark and, and, and Dr. Richard Meadow, maybe it was used for indigo, uh, and maybe this was used to store textiles and, and so forth, but we're still not clear. We have no real evidence uh, as to what this area was used for, but it was obviously an important part of the site. There's also this fantastic uh, sort of double lion head, uh, you know, terracotta object that was found uh, in the 24, 25 excavations. And then there are more pointed base uh, sort of goblets on the left, but this one with uh, inscriptions, which of course are are really interesting and suggest there might have been some ritual use. Uh, this most common uh, ancient Indus sign is on the top right uh, in the goblet as well. And this is what actually Mahadeva noted was the most common uh, terminal sign in the Indus script. Uh, then we have these pots with pots inside them that were opened up uh, and sort of uh, spilled out their uh, kind of remains. 
And then you had in Mount F this tremendous discoveries of these really beautifully done paved, you know, brick uh, floors on the right or walls on the left that were done with such immaculate care, which showed the high level of sophistication uh, of these people. And then some of the images I really, really like are the ones where they show the site and then they show all the objects in the pots as they were uh, discovered exactly at the right level. And you can see here actually a dozen or so pots at different levels uh, in Mount F, which I find uh, just really interesting and a way of doing archaeology and photographing that doesn't really happen uh, much today. Here you see a drain at the bottom left, and you see again a pot. And look how big that pot is, even relative uh, to the man standing next to it. And uh, this is actually uh, Vats uh, with a copper jar. It was found at Harap by the Sin 26. Uh, 27. And imagine excavating in a three-piece suit, but I, I think maybe it's for the photograph he uh, posed here to do that. And then, of course, many different little clay tablets were found, even writing without seals. And this is, of course, what uh, Mr. Mahadevan uh, made such great contributions in helping us to try and decipher these, uh, even though there's still a way to go. And then this is from Cemetery H, uh, the part on the left. And when I was in Delhi a few years ago, I reshot uh, some sort of close shots uh, of this in color, but what amazing work uh, was done. And then there's some more painted pots at the bottom uh, left as well. And let me just end by showing you some of the burial urns. In, in here they found uh, different parts and fragments of skeletons uh, in the cemetery H area. And this is looking uh, you know, towards one of the uh, Mount AB, I think it is uh, in the back. Uh, but with that, I wanted to sort of end my presentation, say thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer any questions and you know our website and you know, Facebook page and we're trying to publish as much of this research you know in the coming year or two and really present to everyone for their own information and uh, enjoyment and, and research uh, all of these images and try and reconstruct that history. So I will stop my share right now. Thank you to okay. Professor Omar Khan. Thank you. Uh, yes, John. Uh, he has given a very excellent uh, presentation of the various archival photograph, which has been taken uh, the first excavation at Harappa as well as Mohanjadaro. Now uh, we are all know that Harappa was excavated in 1921 by Dayaram Sahini. And then after that, uh, in 1923 onwards, to up to 27, uh, the Mohanjadaro were excavated by the Banerji and others. And before that, we didn't know about uh, Harappan civilization because before, before the 1921, when Dayaram Sagini was excavated, prior to that, we didn't know anything about Harappa because generally it is a belief that the Indian civilization started from the Asokan period onwards, but we didn't know. But Dayaram Sagini's excavation, which pushed back our civilization more than 5,000 years. So that is the greatest credit of Dayaram Sagini. Of course, prior to Dayaram Sagini, there are many explorations was carried out. They found some sporadic uh, beads as well as uh, some seals, but they didn't know the importance of that one. So that way, he has brought back 1921 archival material to us and is one of the very excellent uh, presentation. I am really congratulated on behalf of the, the organizers of the Tamil Nadu State Archaeology Department and the scholars assembled here uh, to Professor uh, Omar Khan. And, uh, since the time is very short and Umar Khan is already in online, there are one or two questions, please. Yeah, please. Um, Pro Dr. Balakrishnan, sir. So Dr. Balakrishnan, sir, he was a, a bureaucrat, one of the chief bureaucrat of uh, uh, Indian government. And he is a very excellent uh, scholar. And he has done more than 30 years uh, he extensive work on the archaeology and then field uh, work. He is having one or two questions with you. Uh, Please. So, so Omar Khan, uh, he's not basically interesting uh, just to be an artist. Uh, also, first, uh, on behalf of all the people who assembled here and the uh, archaeology department, also the Industrial Research Center of the Oda Mutia Library, we would like to thank you very much uh, for a very, very wonderful and uh, 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 presentation. And uh, we know that uh, we consider that the uh, harappa.com as the one stop and the repository for all who didn't are they actually involved in the industrial research because yesterday in my presentation I copiously used now everybody knows that if any any image is used that is probably harappa.com 
without uh, without even being acknowledged everybody acknowledged thank you very much for that uh, my uh, kind of contribution you are making we are trying to i would like to only say that we would like to see you in person uh, in chennai very soon uh, if not immediately at least in 2024 when we will have the 100th year of the uh, the industrial civilization announcement we have a uh, plan and mr dayalan pointed out that uh, stories and uh, all other excavation but we fondly remember the day uh, 20th uh, of uh, 24th september 20th for that uh, sherlock holmes type uh, adventure statement made by sir john marshall and without even visiting it is he who basically found the figures of the discovery state uh, otherwise uh, the subcontinental understanding about the india's past would have been buried uh, without the contribution of the people like john marshall who realized that it was not the isolated place but it was indeed a part of a civilization thank you very much that uh, basically we thank you Thank you to Thank you. Balakrishnan sir, and he has given very good compliment to you. And uh, one more question uh, by he is a senior uh, uh, journalist. Um, uh, please introduce yourself and then, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Humar Khan, for the excellent lecture. It was highly educative and instructive. I just have two or three fundamental questions, it's very simple questions. And did John Marshall visit Harappa and Mohanjadaro before he announced the discovery of the civilization on September 20th? Uh, yeah, that's it. Because Nayanjot Lahiri in a book, The Forgotten City says that she did not visit. And, but, so he did not visit uh, Harappa and Mohanjadaro before he announced the uh, discovery in Lon Illustrated London News. And, but did he visit Mohanjadaro after the announcement? I think- uh, Yes, yes, yeah. he, did, he led excavations there then for two years. Uh, so he actually was there on the site and excavated and uh, did some very good work actually uh, there. Although, yes, correct. Yeah, he visited Mohanjadaro after the after he made the announcement, but he never visited Harappa at all. I, you know, I'm not 100% sure about that. I don't remember offhand whether he visited Harappa or not. Yes, sir. And another question, uh, there's a doubt again. <clears throat> there are two versions that it was uh, <clears throat> D.R. Bandarkar who discovered <clears throat> and there's another version that Rakaldas Banerjee, who excavated in 1922, that it was he who discovered uh, Mohanjadra. Who discovered? To whom should we give credit when we say Mohanjadra was discovered? Was it Bandarkar or Ban R.D. Banerjee? I, I think that generally credit is given to Banerjee uh, because he really did the first excavations there and you know put it down as something that really needed to be uh, researched further. So my understanding is that but typically it's Banerjee and uh, uh, who gets the credit for it. Yes, sir. And I thank you for your wonderful website. As Mr. Balakshini said, it is a one-stop uh, uh, place for fantastic information and wonderful pictures. I thank you for running that website so successfully. And it's a wonderful website that you're running. And we thank you for the wonderful, excellent and instructive lecture you gave. I am T.S. Subramanian. I retired from the Hindu newspaper and Frontline magazine. I have been- Thank you. Thank you very much. Did not visit, and uh, uh, at that time the headquarters of the Archaeological Survey of India was not located in Delhi. It was located in Simla, and where it is the uh, the uh, audit and uh, the AG audits office is located. Delhi is supposed to be known as civil secretary. The office of the ASI was located there. John Marshall, during his, uh, uh, he calls all the with Bonaji and Sari, everybody. Some of the material, uh, the excavated material were in Lahore, something were in Nampur, some material was with the Bonaji's personal custody in Calcutta. All of them bring the, all the material by train, and then there was a two-day uh, conference uh, organized by uh, John Marshall. Before that, uh, these three excavators, they were basically like this recipe they had it with the, all the excavators, they wore it up in the sense that they, they excavated it, it is there and they, they will keep talking about it. But the first time a man who was not excavated put everything together on a table, there was a huge thing. I visited that particular building after the he put everything. This is the Harappa, this is Mohanjadra, the distance is 600 kilometers. Then he measured the material and he found that the distance is so much, so standardized. 
debate, they debate everything. He come to conclusion that unless a huge expanded system is there, which is which he can be called as a civilization, this will not match. Then he makes a statement that I have not visited, but I venture to take. That's what Nail Jyoti Nagari told us. She said there is a Sherla home. That's a type of some people work in the industry, a Sherla home type of a thing. He made it after that, he visited the rest of his team. The fact remains, the fact remains that the contribution made by Ram Mathur, and we are also witness to many things, based on one particular uh, small input, uh, based on the interpretation, the whole history can be pushed by 5,000 years. And then we are all witnessing that in India, there is no surprise that the contribution of the Ram Mathur under no surprise that the same under fact. Uh, immediately we visited this team, it was like that we got with it. But the other two people who called that as a before the, uh, the industrial civilization was announced, was considered to be in the stupa. And when the when the uh, army discussed that the black it was never considered to be a civilization or stupa is there. Even even then, even now there's a stupa is there. So it is the visionary institution which is the world has now come to know that it's the largest civilization there. That is the role which has been played by and it's part of the time you Just, uh, 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 just uh, it is a, just um, a clarification uh, what you are telling uh, because uh, prior to you are the next one. Actually, Harappa and Mohanjadaro was not, it won't mean that nobody knows about that. Because even 1921, prior to that also, people know about that. Because many of the, the British officers, they passed through, they, you know, even the British officers, they passed through, they collected a lot of seals. And they didn't know the importance of that one. Only when Dayaram Sahini excavated in 1921, then only they will understand. Same way in Mohanjadaro also, because before Banerjee, there are many people, they visited the site. And they collected the potteries. Only when Mahanja, when the excavation was carried out by Banerjee, then only they realized the importance of that one. Of course, it is a long discussion. We don't uh, take much time out of that because there are more papers are to be presented here. And uh, I'm really thankful to uh, Mr. Omar Khan. He has given very excellent presentation and he has brought back uh, the whole data pertaining the archival data uh, of the uh, Dayaram Sahini and Banerjee. We really congratulate him. And we hope that we will meet him soon in the same, I mean, uh, in Tamil Nadu or somewhere else soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next presenter uh, speaker is um, uh, Dr. Sherian. We all know about the Cherian uh, because he is the one person who has made a very vital excavation at Patanam, which is one of the very remarkable maritime trade center of all South India. And we all know Musuri, it was known as one of the important maritime trade center in the Sangam literature. There are a lot of Sangam literature talks about that. But he made through his excavation at Patanam, what are the thing, what are the narration in the Sangam literature? It making it's true through his excavation by the Patanam. Because Patanam, there we got a lot of maritime trade activities, the various countries, particularly the Western India, Western world, as well as the Eastern world. I request uh, uh, Dr. Cherian to present this uh, presentation. Actually, we are so excited to listen to the first excavation in Mohenjadaro. I thought it should not have ended because there was also some discussion. You know, it's a true 
truth that the legacy of such a great person like Airavadam is still active. I should say something more about the presentation of Amar Khan. You know, he ended with a slide which showed a lot of urn burials. I don't know there is any other place other than Cheranad that has come across such a motley wide variety of urn burials. There was so much curiosity I was looking at the various things that was found. And the beginnings are always, you know, problematic. And I don't like Subramanian being introduced as a journalist. No, no, he's a researcher. I think everybody here is a researcher. Not our backgrounds. We should stop talking like that. Especially if you want to go to Muchri Patanam or Sankham Age, at least for a moment, you should decide that you should disown every identity that you have. Because you are going to learn about a people who have nothing to do with any of your identities, whether professional, whether academic, nothing of that sort. Yes, absolutely. It's a kind of smallness that we call people by something. Rajan used to say, we are human beings. So that is very important even for archaeologists, I am surprised. Making such a long journey back, still they are, we are all very small, small people. At least intellectually, we should be sensitive enough to understand what they were. So it was, but for the kind of force Rajan Shivananda and Bhagilishmi force, I would not have been here. I think he brought me here. His legacies brought me here. So what should I talk? Now after seeing Mr. Khan, I thought I should also should have told you the beginnings of Muchiri Patanam excavations. You know, that is not very important, but what we got is important. Anyway, after much thought, I gave this title spirituality versus religiosity. The spirituality, you know, you can all have different types of definitions, like quotes, like Dayanandan's identities. You know, some kind of thing, smallness that we carry, we define our spirituality. To me, it was the Anpu, Unmai, Pasam, and Pagatarava. I am trying to use a different language. I'm, not, I'm sure. I know Tagore is with me. You know, here is a beautiful prayer saying, give me a language so that I can tell about my ancestors to those who really are trapped in the present. He too is present, trapped in the present. I am trapped in the present. But you know, it's a different journey that we make and we need a spirituality of a sort. And don't take Anbu Unmai Pasam and Pagtaru also casually. Because the words have been reduced to carry meanings that have instant meanings. You know, I will relate Anpu with the Sri Narayana Guru. You know what he said? Anukamba. He wrote a poetry called Anugamba Dashagam. There is so much passion, not compassion. In English, you say compassion. It's also every word. Unmai to me is Ulkanti. Unmai, some people say truth. What is truth? You know, the Sankhamage people have an atomic way of understanding the world, the Aham Puram. You know, both are very important not just be within ourselves and outside, but in the nature. You know, they had no magic of the type of gods we had 
to understand, but they had their intelligence. So they said the aham could be little complex and little more beautiful. That is the ulkandi. Not worried about what color you are. They were not. And also, I'm afraid they are very much gender neutral. I, I, I appreciate what uh, Balakrishnan said about fertility and mother goddess. You know, that was not part of any gender issues. That is biology. Only females can do carry this wonderful, not just the womb issue. Their lavanya is different. It's not a matter of giving birth. So it's huge. So pasam is also something what we in Malayalam called valsalyam. It is affection. You have very narrow meanings and definitions. And Pagutta River, I often say what Romila Thapa tells me, you know, you should have logical reasoning. You have analytical skills. You have autonomy. And also, you should have creativity. Then only you will reach a level that we call Pagutta River. The wise man, the wisdom, the quiet man, Aravan Adigal, was the academic of Sangha Mej. You know him? I know most of you know. He was the guide, philosopher, patron of Mani Mekhali. Whenever she was in stress, she used to go. Will we go to any sort of academic to get some kind of stress solved? So that was the spirituality of the times. And religiosity is something that we all have. Because since the last 2000 years, maybe 1500 years, the world is dominated by two types of religions. One is Semitic religions, and the other is caste-based religions. Sangamej was not affected by that. See, they, they had a different religiosity. With your religiosity, you cannot understand the spirituality of religion of the Sangamej. That is my point. Today, you have a spirituality that leads to religiosities. Not that it is not important. Not that the Pallava period onwards is not important. They are all important. But if you want to make a journey into Sangha Mej, you have to disown. For a moment, intellectually distance yourself and try to understand this. Actually, today morning, I was looking at the newspaper. I read only Hindu. I keep away from all media if possible. And I was surprised that there was no news about this early Tamil culture and heritage in the newspaper, including. So I said, he lived in this city. He was such a huge scholar. You know, Rajan yesterday remembered he going to his house. I also remember. You know, I remember meeting him first time. That was in 2021 in the Indian History Congress. I saw him along with Romila Thapar. You know, I thanked my stars. By the time I had some close familiarity with Romila Thapar. So she introduced me along with my teacher to him. That was an exciting moment. And I was observing all through the inaugural session how they were talking each other, how they are going about for tea. You know, they were like two kids. Two great scholars in excitement, in sharing, laughing, loving. So that was, I won't forget that moment. Then as I, I also met him several times. Over that, I talked to him over the phone about this, about which I wanted to talk to you because he identified from, as a, from everywhere else 
the Tamil Brahmi inscriptions. And for me, that was very, that for us, that was very important. So I saw this photograph and you know, this Gandhiji's grandson's presence and also Ram's presence strike me. All of this, you know, they are all, they are all Tamils except this Bengali, uh, uh, except the Bengal former governor. You know, I was wondering, you know, how Mucharipatnam and its beginnings got to know among the Tamilians, but for the Hindu, you know, nobody bothered it. In Kerala, you'll be surprised. You know, every news of the excitement we shared in the site were never taken by the uh, news media. It is not their fault. You know, no, I am not an exclusion. Because I even didn't know anything about Sangam age when I was a student and a teacher. Very little, very faint. I think even now it is true. You can ask, leave out all the early chief ministers. You can ask the recent chief ministers of Kerala and ask them, what do you know about Sangam age? They will be shocked. But <laughs> But ask the Tamil chief ministers. They will certainly say so many stories. One of them made film on Chilapadigaram even. And so many things. So that is the vast difference. And so I just wanted to show this image, which I happened to see because there was no news on Airavada Mahadev and so many things were being said yesterday. So let me don't waste time rather tell you about the Sankham age that had three dozens of port sites, over three dozens if you take the small ones. And if you take the reality of India, you know, India was not there before 1946. So again, we have to distance. The literal or the natal of Sankham age was going and going and going and connecting. And from Bergasa to Tamralikti, there are dozens of port sites that were connected. And that laid the foundations of probably the marine provenance, pros, the marine history of Indian Ocean. We have no idea. We all look at as individuals, their background, their profession, their academic. Similarly, I am destined to Patanam, Patanam, Patanam. I, now, I have done it over. So I was asking. So I have my students, my niece was here. So her teacher said, no, no, we are looking for you to listen to Patanam. No, no, I am not going to say much on Patanam because I have already spoken, uh, I have spoken. So I, want, I would like to say what Khan was also telling, you know, anytime you can call us. You have five, 10 people ready, we can have a conversation on what is Mujeri Patanam, anytime. We all stay in the site with your ancestors. Now 93 centimeters down, we are waiting for excavation from, as a license from ASI to go further. So we are all there, you can see even a trench. So I just wanted to say that was a connectivity that extended from Gibraltar to South China during the Sangham age. And I consider it to start from 10th century BC because at Patanam, the earliest settlement evidence was from the Iron Age, that is from 10th century, and how it grew into a kind of a legendary port, which not our historians, but many European historians say, it was something similar to your Shanghai. You mean your means the world's Shanghai. If you have seen it, I have two chances of going there. It's amazing. Something like New York, something like London, or if you have gone to the wharf of uh, Mumbai, something like that. So it was this connectivity that made Mujiri Patanam for the local people and Mujiris for the entire world, a legendary port, and but was lost. 
till it was discovered in the 21st century you should imagine it was discovered only the first trial excavation was in 2004 then like as what happened in monjidaro for three four years no one was worried again it restarted in 2007 and after 11 seasons now it's at a critical stage anyhow i want to search for the significance of this area you know no boundaries now we have boundaries no need to have boundaries when you study sangam age and don't speak to me as a malayali i am a tamilian so there was no boundaries and it was could have been one of the most wonderful federal system that might have existed you think of the characters of these two epics they travel without any passport visa police nothing they travel they move around they all come to the place where we are now manchi or muchri patanam they ended their journeys there couple of them ended their journeys in mathurai but they all started in putar so you have also lot of literature not just the archaeological evidence that is substantial you know year before last i came to meet shivanandan and colleagues so i told them i want to see all your sangamage sites and sangamage materials i counted they are 29 or 24 we all took notes it's amazing and in kerala there is only one site of course we have lot of iron age sites but not with habitation evidence but the, of course dr rajan used to say even the real sites are also habitation sites <laughs> that is true but we don't know how they lived but now you have you know very advanced scientific knowledge with us recently in sabarkand i was told by the oxford university scientist when i told we have 45 lakhs of pottery from less than 1% of the site excavates he said you give me 15 20 shirts pottery shirts and one brilliant student i'll have a phd we will have a phd because he saw that he can be crushed and all the organic materials extracted to identify every aspect of the life that was associated with the provenance of of the clay no details you know i was not reluct i was very reluctant to come because from stanford university a researcher is now in patna you know he is studying pottery and four years he was digging bernike that was the destination port of sangam sites not just mujhri many historians say sang patna patna mujhri no it was all these sites are represented there and luckily you know he with his permission of his director gave me a wonderful image of buddha for the first time in this january they excavated a buddha image don't think it is from kerala tamil nadu or the material is from turkey that was probably my last <laughs> last slide because it was only discovered in january now let me go fast and balance up please control me because i might go on talking like this uh, so no problem you can say next five more minutes or something like that so next next oh he also forgot yeah these are the sangam sites next so this is the sangam age sites when we spread all over the world there were more than can you click one more it is there is a title for it no no next back back yeah this one no 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 back 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 just back 
not back now. Your previous, previous. Previous. Now next. Next. So you are going back. No, no. Oh, I think there might be some differences. No, no, no. You are going back. Go back. Oh, I can do it here. Oh, okay. Sorry, technology, technology. Yeah, sorry. So this is the time that this site spread across the world. That is three continents. We call it as the old world. Europe, Africa, and Asia. And starting from Hippo site, yeah. oh, sorry, uh, Hippo site is in South China. Uh, that is uh, where the maritime Silk Road starts. And uh, Tamralipti was in Bengal, and Arakamedu in Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry, then Puhar and Korkai, and comes to uh, Patanam, and also two sites, uh, three, four sites in, in Sri Lanka, and uh, several sites. I cannot mention all these things. Only I showed you to say Tamil Nadu government has to take the initiative that not just we are excavating Tamil Nadu. I'm grateful for the Chief Minister making a statement in the Assembly that Mujiri Patanam is dear to Tamil people, not just in Tamil Nadu, across the world. So I had the opportunity to dig and participate with my students in several sites. These are the sites that is surrounded. In 2016, I was about to go to Bernike site from where Buddha was found and but that could not be done but still it is possible the Tamil Makal are very passionate about their past and Sangham age is an important phase in human history for several reasons for the sort of spirituality devoid of Semitic religions and caste based religions not very dominant they might have been present in, in in, in, in strands, but not very dominant. So next, I will do it. So just want to see how the kind of spirituality is reflected in the materials. Again, I'm searching a new language for that. So I only want to show this shed. Uh, you know, this was discerned with the help of Airavada Mahadevan. And I told you, out of the 1,30,000 artifacts, you know, Kijadi had 7,000. We had 1,30,000 artifacts. None of them has any religious indications. So what it means? They were spiritual in a nuanced sense, in a very extreme, sophisticated sense, which you all know deep inside you what it means. So he was so excited. I don't want to reveal. You can just Google Subramanian, Patanam, Airavada Mahadevan, and Amana you will find he giving a long interview to him, telling about the significance of Mujiri Patanam work. So he passionately told me everything two days back. And when we gave a press release, you know, Hindu published in such a great importance. And Airavadam Mahadevan, you can read that, you should read that because I'm not going to explain all that. 
it's not a kind of it's an occasion for my students there out there and the teachers there to search and identify what this means these are metaphors i just want can tell you in 20 or 25 minutes so this tells that a huge pot that was there at muchiri patanam belonged to a sage sort of a person an academic probably a spiritual man of that times not this times you know they will have different attributes he was quiet he was living there and it carried his water or his materials or the sailors or the merchants wanted to store their things with him to construct that conduct is extremely difficult because as you can see it's a huge rim of a pot and if the pot and its pieces are there only if you know oxford university laboratory helps us to extract the organic material from there we will talk about more about him otherwise we will talk about our spiritualities so it is a different spirituality you see and i am grateful for idavadam for blessing me on that occasion so from being a person living in the 21st century i am also religious i am a spiritual not in the conventional sense but i was looking for the object to show you what attracted them to make symbols you know they had the iron a uh, sorry lion which is not as yesterday we had anywhere in south india only in gujarat it had it was there and we have another kind of a i don't call even goddess you know who amalgamated the pre semitic things to the semitic things it's a important question who said they also had gods like us who really saw somebody who saw it no i doubt there was a amalgamation that killed the essence of early history this is seeking for a new language i am not asserting i have read some materials on religions but after enlightenment nobody in europe will say enlightenment they will say that all the puranic gods continued in the semitic age they call something like balakrishna sir was talking spirit they were they were spirits of sort but it is convenient for our religiosity our kind of spirituality to call them gods so i don't know whether it's a god or goddess but i know it's a female having one symbol in his hand is corn the other is that of a boat steering of a boat now that was important in their life some others say it was the tyche goddess of greece later it became fortuna of the romans today we, we have fortuna cards anyhow spirituality differs and so this was one of the probably spirits that saved us in the year 2020 you know we had great difficulty in excavating we had license from asi we had everything but people prevented us from excavating and a poor villager who had only 5 cents of land for three spinster sisters you should all go there and me and four or five cows he came after us please excavate so we got this or well, you can also google there was a article written in the in the friend line on this discovery and it was a prolonged article it can be so i'm going fast actually this is the kind of exchanges i don't think trade of the sort that we know never existed in this period 
there was no common exchange system there was no rate there was no currency and Karl, Karl Polyard is the philosopher who says that was a system in which a more complicated barter system was operational economics study that you know you look at their face and give it because the giver is more happy he appeared than who gets it everybody was a giver everybody gave others so to a great extent in the initial days there would have been a barter system that was operational in which the principle that one who gives is more happier than one who gets it so they gave each other the best that is possible so the mediterranean portraits are in large numbers and you know it has cost 9000 and we have located nine mediterranean locations from where different ports came to here it's also found in Arkamedu and different sites in South India and also in the littoral other parts of India. This is huge. We got three from Ayurangulam and 179 from Patanam. Can you imagine? So huge importance because this was a very prestigious shared, uh, prestigious spot of those times. And the Arabian shared got 2000 plus this year also i can see Uttaras, who was in charge of the pottery sitting there she got a couple of them because we only excavated 93 centimeters then south arabian Ovoja, that is a new type we identified very late therefore only 84 you know, it's very difficult to identify no indian knows really you have to get hold of a person who studied these things and they are mostly european they are very busy people also this is the torpedo jars we have crossed 4000 because you know from third century onwards we see the arabian connection of sankam age with this region and naturally it is very significant that it is easily identifiable. You, you have vitamin marks there, and also the Chinese ceramics of a later period. And the architecture, you know, it's always is exciting for me. The architecture of Sangam age was never imposing. They had close contact with the Roman things that was, you know, for elephants. So take off this, uh, this building. Elephants can easily come inside but their their vision of life their definition of life was respecting human scale so you wanted to have houses you had to have warehouses you had, you should have public spaces where the human scale was respected and also the privacy we have toilets we had the technology and it also had a philosophy behind it you cannot show atom bomb with the spirituality of our times so i didn't get many many uh, tools or weapons that can be used for offending somebody in archaeological site like patanam nothing i can say so i have to argue you know we are in the beginnings of learning it so i cannot say they were they were violent people they were spiritual in some different sense so this is the iron that was the backbone of the Sangam age. And it was so strong that you can see the number of materials and its variety, its kind of typologies, they are all. And like in Harappa, you know, these people loved ornaments. They beautified themselves. And it is interesting to see that I'm going fast. Gold was then also a very favorable thing. And this is different. This I brought for the Bharatiya University a lithic workshop. And so I thought I will include it. There are much, the wastage, lapidary workshops were there. So 
I think this is for students to see and more discussions we can have on online and very wonderful kind of artifacts that really brings out the spirituality of the people of the Sangam age. And cotton weaving was known to them. And finally, you know, these people were really spiritual in the sense that they had no identities, that they wanted others to be the other. You know, we got several bone samples and we gave 12 for ancient DNA studies. It was started in CCMB, then further went to Oxford University and also the greatest university probably is the University of Georgia, which has very advanced facilities of dating and further studies. They told us three things. These people, four of them belong to South Asia. Three belong to Europe. Four belong to West Asia and the Eastern Africa. So this was the kind of spirituality, no distancing. And of late, you know, we have found evidence of 40 cultures, 40 language speaking people in Mujri Patanam. Can you believe? Today morning I was talking to somebody, he said he has language problems. I said, you should come to Mujri Patanam. There you can speak to <laughs> 40, in 40 languages. It is unbelievable. <laughs> It is unbelievable. It's not, it is not anything I'm telling in the magic. You can touch these 40 objects that came from different parts of the world. Not all people might have come, at least two dozen have come. Anyhow, uh, this is, and this is the indigenous part of it. You know, many people ask, in Europe, this they call it a Roman site in India. I fight them back. I said, will you, call any site in Europe an Indian site. No, no, they will never call. That was Eurocentric knowledge. This is the site of the indigenous people from all over the world. And it is Noam, Noam, Noam Chomsky who said, if any survival of humanity is there, you go back to your ancestors, your indigenous people. And so, out of this 45 lakhs, only 1.1 lakh is from outside India. So I call this pottery also Sankhamej pottery. It is not just to emphasize, after Harappa, I think this is the most complex site where 40 linguistic groups came and thrived, celebrated life celebrated spirituality. How many fellowships we should all offer? The rich among you should now on start a fellowship for a good student to study some aspect of this life. It's important. So if you distribute all the materials that was found from Mujri Patanam, you will see that this connectivity this connectivity across three continents. On the, all your ancestors, especially the women, they traveled. They had no restriction then. It was a general neutral society, probably to a great extent. I just want to show in minutes what happened in Bernike this season. I have much to say. I have also worked two seasons there. But this guy, Nick, who came, was excited. I, there are also temples. I don't know whether they are temples. They are sacred spaces to me. And one principle of their spirituality was, you know, every group, every sailor, every merchant, when they came, they brought their spirit or divinity with them and they had a space for it. The surface temple was the site I also worked because the director asked which area you want. I said the area where you got 7.5 7 kgs of pepper. So I went there and I dug. You know, under the floor of that surface 
sacred space. We got 7.5 black pepper from Sangam. So Sangam Cheras, so probably anywhere could be. I don't know then the geography and the environment. Whichever produced that pepper, it is from South India. So another kind of similarity is the kind of intaglio sauvishod. And this is in something that they discovered last season. You know, it is a ceremonious burial of a falcon. You know, their spirituality was different. A falcon was ceremoniously buried. And also there are burials of dogs, elephants. And there's a great settlement of Tamil people in Bernike. And the kind of pottery is to use Rajan say truck loads. It's so huge. But no one has ever studied. What are we doing? Yeah? In Daglio. In Daglio. And this is a slab which says some official. Official also, we have to find it what it is. He was from Coptos. Copto was a a, 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 yeah, a port site which reached from Red Sea. In Red Sea port is Bernike. You have to cover 340 kilometers on land, caravan. So you reach Coptos. They have busy areas. Yeah, yeah. Coptic language, Coptic religion, everything is there. They are all not to have any immediate connection with we people. You know, they are Coptic Christians. But they were all pagans. You know, Eurocentric knowledge called or Sankamage people, even Buddhism, Jainism, all pagan religions. That is mean there. We have powerful gods. And the 70 gods, and you should not have more than one. We will shoot you. <laughs> so it was so different spirituality in which we were, you know, born and brought up. So anyhow, this is a wonderful this year. And the last one is so beautiful. This you got this season. This is fantastic. And this Proconisian marble. This is not found in India. And it was in pieces. They brought it together. And it's more feminine. It came out only this season and the first time outside India, especially in Eurocentric world where it was the entry point of Sankham port sales. They found this beautiful image. So I think I wanted Rajan to translate it or Balakrishnan to see this is the spirituality, what Eka Ramanujan said. You also Google and find and read what Eka Ramanujan said. He said, you know, my chronicles of wasted time was when I studied medieval period. <laughs> so he went back to the Tamil genus. Something like that, he said. He said, no time, you know. Anyone across all over this last 2000 years, such a genius existed, such a wonderful people existed. Their language is so nuanced. I love hearing Balayashan. Everyone knew when you talk about when I come to Tamil Nadu, I talk even lay people like today. Also, I asked a driver, What do you know about Sangamage? Please tell me. Because what happens in Kerala, nobody knows. They have such a past. You know, our history, like the American, starts with Columbus, with the 10th century. So it's very sad. We cannot go back. And we can only go back with all our kind of identities there, wire marks, our masks, so many things. You know, we have to go back differently. And also for the children, I just want to say three stories to follow up. One, this man went to China from Sangham age. And this is a picture drawn by a 15th century emperor. And his name was Damo. He, it's said to be he was from that region called Damodaran. 
you know, I was there a couple of months and uh, I asked my translator to find this image or this some information. They brought me a lot of information and one exhibition, this embarrassed picture was also drawn. So try to find out young students about him. And this is my favorite Chilapadigaram and Mani Meghali, I need not tell you. And the last week, this is the image drawn by the poor men of that village who gave us land for excavating the she-spings that was buried for 2000 years or more. And he created it experimentally telling the story of Oedipus and she-spings of central Greece. That is all. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. For yeah. Thank you to Dr. Cherian for the excellent presentation on the uh, glimpses of um, Patanam. And also, he has given a very good explanation about Anbu, Unmai, then Pasam, Pagutarivu. Actually, it's a very good. I thought he is only an archaeologist and doing excavation, but also he is very good in the linguistic. I am really uh, thankful to Dr. Jerian. And um, it's a very good uh, information about the Patanam, as all we know. And since um, the organizer asked me, there's no much time. And we don't have any question at present. Maybe we can discuss uh, this point uh, in the lunch time, and we can push up to the other uh, presentation. Uh, maybe the next presenter. Uh... I was only suggesting uh, to Dr. Cheria, there is a phenomenal quote in Patina Palai that Patinam and this Patinam could be East Coast and West Coast, but the fact remains that it's a part of the Sangami age ideology. Pallayamodu Padipalaki, Veru Veru Vyaranda Muduvai Vokal, Saru Ayar Mudur Sendru Tokang, Moli Pala Perihiya, Palidir Teyat, Pulambayar Makal, Kalandu, Inidu, Urayum, Mutta Chirapin Patinam. Is a cosmopolitan living in a seashore environment that should be the footnote for the uh, multilingual environment he was painting and that is was our strength that was what sangam age is all about it is not a exclusive and you versus the thing we were a different people thank you and, um, <clears throat> next speaker is um Bahala Ansumalik Mahop Daya. And uh, actually, the topic is a very lengthy topic. I hope uh, she can. Uh, actually, she is an uh, independent uh, researcher on Indus script and Indus Valley language. And uh, she is uh, trying to uh, understand the structural and semistic, I mean, semitic aspect of the Indus script to explore the type of language spoken in the Indus Valley people. I request uh, the speaker to take over the dais and then take the presentation. <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like you are industrially all vacants. <laughs>
In Bengali, we call this omai gola, means a um, voice which doesn't even need a microphone, so loud. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. I have only 20 to 25 minutes to talk about in the script in front of this erudite audience. Now there is a book named Around the World in 20 Days, which records an incredible balloon flight which started in Switzerland and ended in Africa. For me, covering in the script in 20 minutes is no less difficult than exploring the world in 20 days. So to avoid wasting even a minute, I have written out my whole talk. Bear with me. Uh, remembering Sir Iravata Mahadevan, who once affectionately called me his long lost granddaughter, granddaughter, I start the talk. I also thank Arumaran, Dr. Sinder, and State Archaeology Department of Tamil Nadu for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I thank Ranujay Adhikari of Cambridge University, who had initiated me into the in the script world, and my father, uh, Professor Amate Mukhopadhyay, who has sustained me in my lonely journey through Indus Valley as an independent self-funded researcher. So a quick glance. Indus inscriptions are mostly in this. OK, why is it happening? Yeah. So Indus inscriptions are mostly found on. Indus inscriptions are uh, somehow going on. Yeah. Indus inscriptions are mostly found on miniature seals, tablets, stamped clay tags, stamped pottery vessels, pottery graffiti, ivory rods, etc. Next, uh, this talk is about the semantic scopes of the Indus science that very frequently occur in the triminal positions of Indus inscriptions. I call them first final science, first final type one and first final type two science. Type two science normally follow type one science. So now I claim that Indus inscriptions were used mostly for administrative purposes, such as taxation, licensing, and access control. I also claim that some of the signs occurring very frequently in the terminal or first final positions where names were brought taxation categories related to certain metrological and menstrual standards prevalent in IVC. So this is possibly the point where you get righteously suspicious. Firstly, what is the proof? that in the script was written using meaning units and word units, not alphabets or syllables. Next, how do we know about, know that in the cells and tablets were used for taxation, licensing, etc. Finally, what is the relationship between tax names and metrological units at all? So now I can, cannot give you all the detailed archeological script internal, statistical, linguistic, and historical evidence in this 20 to 30 minute session to substantiate my claim. So I shall tell you a story, a story about how Indus merchants and traders made a highly sophisticated system of a mercantile script so that they could trade with each other using certain standardized rules, could form guilds, could control who could trade what and where, could extract taxes and build roads, reservoirs, drainage systems for public usage. My claim that in the, in the script was written using ideograms or semasiograms, that is meaning units, and in some cases, logograms, that is word units, is published in a double blind peer reviewed nature group journal in 2019. So it analyzes the semantic co occurrence restriction patterns shown by Indus science that proves that this theory is almost of mathematical certainty. I can elaborate on this in the question and session if anyone is interested. So that means these are written with semant semantic or meaning units or you know word units, not phonological symbols, not a spelled out manner. So re regarding the taxation and licensing, uh, my self archive paper titled Gilbreth Trading, Taxation, Tax Farming, Trade and Craft Licensing, Access Control, Economic practices of Indus civilization encoded in Indus script. It is getting peer reviewed as of now. So an earlier preprint version of this paper, whose main argument regarding Indus script's role in taxation was archived by me in 2018. Uh, archaeologist 
Professor Massimo Vidale, teaching at the University of Padua, is one of the foremost experts on Indian civilization. Vidale had actually cited my 2018 preprint and said the following about it. He said, we should seriously consider from manifold viewpoints the possibility that these tokens, the tax uh, stamps like uh, the seals and tablets, were systematically used to regulate prestation transactions and tax flows across the world compounds and external communities, which formed and gave life to Harappan early cities. So I say this only because uh, this is kind of a radical idea maybe, so there might be some truth value in it. Uh, so my recently published paper on the Ivorian toothword Pilu is related to IVC languages, not script. Since I'm talking about the script, not the language, only occasionally the ancestral Dravidian based hypothesis might be needed to explain certain symbolism. So I'm skipping this for now. So let us get to the story. In the integration era, IVC needed a mercantile script. Now, before the integration era, even since the Neolithic period, different regions of Indus civilization were specializing in many craft production techniques. For example, Mehergar of 6000 BC has yielded gemstone beads. Places near Gujarat possibly specialized in shell-based crafts. So these Indus settlements distributed across around 1 million square kilometers must have had different languages, dialects, and distinct religious and cultural beliefs. So think about the language, diversity, and religious practices across India. There are different types of emphasis in different states as well. So when in the integration era, that is 2600 to 1900 BC, the traders started interacting with each other, forming a complex trade network where local commodities were exchanged between distant settlements, they most possibly formed different guilds that control such trades. Those traders' guilds and artisans' guilds controlled the trade and craft making in some settlements. Such guilds might have been part of the settlements, governing bodies, forming oligarchic units. Actually, according to Arthashastra, the Northwest India, there are those are the main concentration of uh, non-state non kind of like oligarchic units uh, that actually uh, you know the, you know uh, rule the settlements or govern um, in some other settlements there could be rulers kings chieftains etc who control the administration now these rulers or the oligarchic bodies had created some commercial centers small like chanhudaro certain towns like lothal and also certain big cities like harappa mahanjodaro etc uh, so to maintain the city's infrastructure, to create roads, reservoirs, drainage systems, and under public amenities, the oligarchic bodies must have needed control, control resources and labor. So they needed to tax the traders, artisans, cultivators, etc. They also needed to control who can trade inside the cities, who can have workshops of precious commodities inside the cities. So these are fortified control cities. Nobody could just enter them who can supervise such activities also. Hence, they needed to issue corresponding trading, craft licensing and craft making and tax collecting licenses. To control trade, they formed fortified cities with narrow gates, often flanked by chambers. We have that kind of thing in Dholavira North Gate, Western East Chambers. The chambers near the city gates had tax collection officers or tax farmers. Tax farmers are actually people licensed to collect tax by paying a fixed fee to the governing bodies and they will actually benefit from the proceeds. In Mesopotamia, actually in 1700 BC, we have written document about tax farmers and how they sometimes really tortured people. So these tax collectors had inscribed seals issued to them, sometimes also tablets authorizing them. Uh, by the authorities. They counted, weighed, and volumetrically measured different commodities, collected taxes, and stamped the commodities with their seals. The commodities bearing such seal inscriptions then could enter or exit the city. This story is not a fragment, uh, just not a figment of my imagination. Though composed in 400 BC, Arthashastra had recorded economic tradition 
traditions practiced since much earlier than Mauryan period. Moreover, other than the use of iron, uh, horse-drawn curse, etc., possibly Mauryan period was not too different from IVC in the Valley civilization regarding technical advancement. So the traditional practices of administration had possibly continued. Without giving more details, I have a lot to talk about. Let us say that Arthashastra is a great resource to understand ancient economic and commercial administration techniques. So Arthashastra describes some of the responsibilities of the chief collector of customs and octra taxes as setting up custom houses near main gates of fortified cities facing east or north, stationing four or five custom collectors in each post, checking everyone who enters the city, allowing dutiable goods or to be sold only after they had been weighed, measured or counted and duty paid accordingly, keeping records of merchants' names, quantity of their commodities, places where their identity passes were issued. Remember, please remember the Carmen uh, uh, kind of identity passes talked about Professor Toshiki Osada, which were possibly identity passes as for passports and places where the goods were sold. So where were the industries and tablets found? They are often found near fortified city gates, along with standardized weights. According to Mark Kenoyer, such weights were mostly used for taxation. There must have been other standardized vessels, baskets made of reed and all perishable of standardized capacity that accompanies the weights, weights in such tax collection centers. So seals had an important role in tax collection centers. Uh, other details I cannot give now. Seal impressions were found on commodity packages. They had packing materials on their rivers and signs are there. So the chambers, uh, they, uh, that the, which actually the packages that came to warehouses or you were you know, moving in caravans across the cities. The chambers of such warehouses were secured with the same seal impressions as found on the packages. I argue that commodities of similar categories as identified in these inscriptions were processed and then secured in such seal chambers for their next processing. So where are the seals also found? Seals were found concentrated near craft making areas. As an example, I have given an adapted uh, for, uh, figure I have made from the Bagastra and uh, or Goladhoro excavation reports. See the fans, say shell bangle on all these kind of workshops and see how the strategy, uh, how in strategic places the seals are found. Actually excavators were very astronomers from a very small settlement. How could five or six of the same era were found? So my story is that either tax collectors with seals were posted here to collect tax and endorse the merchandise. Alternatively, the workshop owners bought sales for fixed prices or fees like the modern excise levels. So the manufacturers buy the excise levels for a particular price and then they will put those levels on the merchandise to legalize their stamp. So identical seal and tablet inscriptions are found across distant settlements as there were trade regulations imposed by the guilds, oligarchic units, and rulers, influential across settlements, collaborating with each other. Part to Lothal is almost 900 kilometer. Even so, identical inscriptions are found in both places. There are many more examples actually for this. So according to me, actually this is also talked about before in by Vidale Frenes in other ways. So the iconographies were emblems of issuing authorities. So for the seals, uh, when they, you are seeing a seal stamped, you have to know who has stamped the seal. So the guild names being proper nouns of different languages and dialects obviously could not be encoded, encoded using semasiographic or logographic symbols. It's not a phonological script after all. This is possibly the reason why in the seals used iconographies to as insignia of their issuing authorities. Now, most of the Indus iconographies were animal centric, bulls, goats, unicorns, so-called tigers, elephants, etc. Interestingly, Indian tribes and clans uh, it's a, are traditionally named after animals. Like in Veda, we uh, get uh, to know about Mahabrisha, Aja, Matsya, etc. 
uh, uh, in several South Indian tribal subclans are there like Bhak, Purli, Naga, Meghala, Cheli, Ane, Jinka, Adu. Please, uh, my pronunciations will be horrible, I sure, I'm sure. So uh, in prehistoric and early historic India's punch, punch mark coins, they have also used similar zoomorphic iconographies as insignias of the Rishwin clans and dynasties. So the iconographics used for industries were most certainly emblems of these organizations. Interestingly, the most popular in this iconography, the unicorn, is found in at least 65% of the seals, which are discovered from varied stratigraphic layers across several in the settlements. These iconography also accompanies a wide range of inscriptions. Thus, the unicorn was possibly the traditional emblem of a group of merchant guilds, which controlled several types of trades and crafts across various settlements over generations. Interestingly, as Professor Vidale has pointed out, there is a, uh, the bull-based iconographies are mostly found in the industries found in Western Asia. Possibly though that clan was uh, involved in the Western, Westerly trade of IVC. So the places where these guilds were influential, the stamped goods were legal legalized there, else the same good was stamped twice or thrice. For example, Lothal tax with unicorn and rhinoceros. Uh, so contrary to popular belief, names of owners or proper nouns were not encoded. So I call, actually, if you have a thought experiment across 1 million square kilometer, people are taking bath, mothers are naming their children. Then the child will become a trader, right? So from different culture and languages, different person's names will be there. If a series, if a script is not phonologically encoded, if it is symbol based, how can you trade, uh, train, uh, you know, traders across 1 million square kilometer to decode and encode a name by semasiographic symbols? That's possibly not possible. That's impossible. So that is a very illogical thinking that uh, these uh, seals were having names of people. So names of actually tax and licensing categories, according to my theory, names of tax commodities and license crafts, tax rates, tax paying modes, types of tax paying uh, entities, etc. These kind of things were actually uh, uh, encoded in this. Series. Actually, Arthashastra gives a very interesting clue. It doesn't talk about a merchant name. It says, if on a caravan you have a particular seal that is saying the caravan has commodity A and you are actually having that package of commodity B, say you are saying it is a silver carrying package and uh, sorry, gold carrying, a silver carrying package and you, are, you have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, but it is actually carrying gold. So you are paying less tax, right? So for this kind of manipulation, Arthashastra had given a prescription of, you know, uh, punishing those traders. That means commodity names were used in sales. So modern tax stamps, if we analyze, in different parts of modern tax stamps, different type of information will be encoded, right? So in, uh, say, the type of stamp, like beer stamp, right? Then standard measure of the tax good, like barrel, one six barrel, one eight barrel, etc. Different iconographies like about the issuing authority kind of thing. Mode of tax payment. Here it is not a barter based economy, so it's always money, cent, dollar, etc. And then tax receiver, like internal revenue. Interestingly, Indus inscriptions also have a very similar formulaic structure. Certain signs only occur in their phrase final or terminal positions. They also have subcategories. One, like PF2 signs will always, you know, occur. Uh, PF2 signs will be always following the PF1 signs. Certain signs only occur in preface final positions, this kind of signs, PPF signs, only before the PF1 signs. Certain signs function as subordinating conjunctions and coordinating conjunctions. That's a very interesting linguistic feature in such a small phrase. For example, so-and-so tax paid to so-and-so or license for such and such things kind of phrases could be used in the connectives for and to. 
so these are the these are the connective parts you know this part and this part all of, of all often uh, occur independently in certain other cells certain signs predominantly occur in the pre connective positions and certain numbers will always precede in a very uh, you know uh, particular way some of the uh, uh, semasiograms or meaning units so the uh, inferred semantic scope so today i will mainly focus on this part that this is a most generic information according to shannon's principle of information theory in any in any communication system if you have something always were coming in a predictable way that will have the least information so it, when it is applied in the scope of in the script this is the most predictable part so this will have the most generic type of information in the cells and tablets if they are used for taxation and licensing this will be names of tax and licenses according to information theory that's a very logical conclusion let us see what history says and symbolism says so generic information semantically correlated to pf1 this should be actually tax paying modes you know some or sometimes it's tongue type signs are always occurring with it maybe say hypothetically if this is some metal or metal worker uh, product or something then this is that kind of a specific tax maybe so uh, these are the core informational segment so in these places names of related commodities and crafts will be together they are the taxed commodities for which i am get paying tax or getting license the connectives i always already talked about paid to paid for that kind of a thing will be mentioned sometimes actually metrological symbols will come there encoding additional meaning what kind of tax what is that specific type that etc and these are the pre connective signs they are possibly the tax receiver entities for example uh, uh, i'll not go further detail but this will sign will for very different reasons were always uh, symbols traditionally symbol of sovereign authority tax uh, taking uh, our kings etc so it could have, could be related to that so the structures and semantic contents of indus inscriptions can be very well compared to the texts of modern tax stamps and licenses so if i just write it in a you know flat way what we saw in those places internal review, uh, revenue for this amount of beer or this much of payment and document type so here again i have normalized it from left to right for easy comparison so tax receiving entity for connective sign core informational part see sometimes uh, having this uh, numerical signs so this one by six barrel beer that kind of thing some quantification some commodity then how you are paying is very important in a barter based that kind of a system so uh, if as many scholars say that these kind of symbols the single symbols actually uh, there are grain signs so when the grain is arranged in a uh, jar like arrangement it can be like a uh, grain based tax payment i think i think in dravidian puravul nela that is how to pay tax through uh, am i uh, am, am i mispronouncing maybe through dhanya dhanya deya how to pay ta the the tax that are given through grains and there are dravidian equivalents also so that kind of a thing very many a times related symbols for example this this is a fish sign this is a terminal sign one complete message this is another fish sign terminal sign another complete message here these two a plus b are getting combined with the terminal that is that means in some of the licenses are saying you can authorize you are authorized to trade or take taxation on these two commodities some are only for this so in various uh, 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 documents we can have a parallel actually for example one moment see okay i have not given it here sorry i have not given the slide yep 
actually here here uh -huh. okay so this one you see some tax stamps are for gas some are for electric light they are only having that gas and electric light written on them because these are related commodities in some tax stamps these these two will be combined a very interesting parallel with the fish sign kind of sequence with the tax name so tax rate hypothesis is the most plausible explanation of the numerical signs you know why a uh, very uh, fast if i go sales by definition record certain rules that have to be repeatedly followed in certain types of transactions that numerals present on sales cannot be used to record quantity of a specific barter and in this numerals were too simple and too rigid in pattern to be able to encode any ad hoc number so this pattern that only a limited number of uh, range of numerical signs got used in index inscription is in explained by the fact that tax rates are generally expressible through a very small set of numerals. For example, in modern India, 5%, 12%, 18%, 20%. Four type of GST taxes, tax rates are expressed. Sure. So, and so I will not go more on this. Uh, now, I am now coming to the main topic. I think I have uh, the ground uh, so that this topic seems relevant now. So why do I identify this phrase final science as meteorological symbols connected to tax names? So a very cursory glance will show that this is the most frequent symbol of industry. The terminal symbol, it is rarely occurs in any other position. And this is a jar. Most of the scholars, including Mahadevan, has said that it is jar. Sparpula possibly said it is related to cow, but even if it is that, cow is also a mode of transaction in that way. So that doesn't matter much. So if it is a jar, intriguingly, many of these rim jar signs were provided with numerical notations, you can see, and they are also present on pottery vessels. So these are the numerical notations which I have called different meteorological. They possibly signify different denominations of certain standard volumetric measure prevalent in IVC. So there are rimless jar signs. Uh, Omar Khan talked about uh, you know pointed based goblets. They are very much like the. Bevel rim vessels of Mesopotamia, standardized capacity used for ration disbursement. So these rimless jar signs are also present on these kind of goblets, possibly the capacity of that. Now, these signs are also present in tablets in the obverse part, reverse part, in a very systematic way. This pattern, like two, three, or four strokes are uh, uh, strokes are preceding this rimless jar sign is only found on tablets. I don't have time. Why? But tablets, I have argued in the paper that they are licenses. So these rimless jar signs were the license fees or license tabs, uh, slabs possibly. In seals, they have another, another type of, you know, occurrences, another type of numerical notations. So load bearer graph phrase final signs. Most of the scholars agree this is a load bearer. We will not waste time on that. So what I say is there are standardized weight-based units signifying the standardized weight-based units prevalent in IBC. Why? Now, historical evidence from Arthashastra and other texts parallels in Mesopotamian and Egyptian records. So exploring ancient volumetric units, it is found that almost all the traditional units of volume were named after various kinds of vessels, jars, and traps used in ancient India. As documented in Arthashastra, the main meteorological units used in its contemporary period uh, for capacity measurement were, and some weight also, Kuruba, Prastha, Arhaka, Drona, Khari, Kumbha, and Baha. Interestingly, almost all these words also mean certain types of vessels in Sanskrit. For example, Drona is wooden vessel trough, Kumbha jar, uh, Prastha, Kuruba, particular grain measures also corresponding standardized capacity vessels. 
Interestingly, terms like Drona and Kumbha are also mentioned in Rig Veda with the same meanings. So a person called, a researcher called Witold Kula, he has said that metrological terminologies never change. So whether I'm not talking about Sanskrit terms here, it's not about the language. One term get, often get calced, but the system remains. The system always sus gets sustained. The metrological system, they have such an inertia for thousands of years. So this evidence is showing that since Rig Vedic era, so also surely before that, these were surviving in Arthashastra, they are present. And so looking at the weight-based metrological units, we find similar situation. So dharana, pala, tula, bhara, etc. are mentioned. So dharana means holding and bearing, carrying. Tula means a balance, weight to hold a balance, etc. So in Tamil also, this tula, tula, tulam, etc. meaning balance and some market weight is there. Besides the specially, specially widespread usage of drona, Tula, etc. Their incredible triumph travel is, you know, great. So in Vyasa's Mahabharata, Brihidraunika is there. That tells the tale of a virtuous man, Mudgala, who lived on a drona measure of grain. Okay. So this drona Nadhaka, they continue to be the main units. Paharpur, copper plate inscription of Gupta period, there, there. Drona Vapa signifying the measure of land required to sow one drona measure of seed grain. The I have uh, three to four more slides only, right? So interestingly, the relationship between these grain measures are also there in Bhaskarajarya's Lilabhati. Pichul is a South Asian thing that call, uh, called, it is, that means load, a traditional way standard. So relationships, so I have only three to four slides. Uh, please bear with me. Thank you. So the relationship between metrological standards and tax names, so parallels in India, Mesopotamia, Egypt. Now the jar signs and load bearer signs signified these units that is there, the evidence is there. What is the relationship? So when taxes collected in kinds, there was no money involved. So how they were collected? So Ms. William J.H. has explained about Egyptian cubit. So Egyptian cubits had a royal version and an ordinary version. So the pharaoh bought goods using royal cubit and subsequently sold commodities using the common cubit. So this is the automation. So royal cubit versus common cubit, the difference between the measures being equivalent to the tax paid to the pharaoh. Similarly, as explained in Arthashastra, to automate re revenue collection, different commodities for different commodities and to avoid repetitive collection, calculation, popular metrological units were manufactured in four standard versions. Ayamana Drona, volumetric revenue standard for royal income. Uh, then Drona standards were trade measure of public Drona, payment measure Bhajaniya, palace measure Antapura Bhajaniya, which were respectively 93.75, 87.75, 21.25% of the Ayamana Drona, that is revenue standard. Similarly, different weights were also used in four different denominations. We have already seen the denomination kind of thing in the jar sign, right? So Drona Mapaka or Dona Mapaka Mahamatta is mentioned as a tax collector in Kurudhamma Jataka. That means this Drona, that is the name of the vessel, the name of the capacity is becoming the name of the tax now. The person who measures with drona and takes tax is drona mapaka. So similarly, sharvhagin, that is sharvhaga, one sixth of tax, that is the epithet of king in India. Romila Thapar talked about it because he is entitled to one sixth of the produce. So from taxation terminology, tax receiver, then to king. Jataka stories talk about Raju Gahaka Amacha, who measured fields with Raju and took those kind of uh, grain taxes. Then in Gurjara Pratihara records, we have a tax name called Skandhaka. Skandha means shoulder. So Skandhaka means uh, tax on sh shoulder load. So these linguistic symbolisms you see, they are so much graphically similar to 
this person skandhaka from shoulder load something is getting you know bone some load is there then uh, this is drona mapaka type of a symbol maybe this is the bevel rim vessel kind of symbol volumetric measure somebody is holding it so in Arthashastra, Kotilja says, talk about different administrative centers for revenue collection. One of them was actually Drona Mukha. That is one of a very big part center of revenue collection. In Mesopotamia, the metrological was Shutu, that is primarily meaning a vessel, a measuring vessel of a standard capacity, also means a tax. Like Drona Vapa, it is also meaning a measure of area based on grain necessary for seeding. And Shutummu means uh, storehouse, Satammu means uh, to the storehouse's supervisor. So see, Drona Mapapka, Drona Mukha, Drona Vapa, Drona. This whole system, just because a system is similar, not because they are imitating each other, is have a, having a parallel. Like uh, our Rajugahaka Amatya in ancient Egypt, tax collectors were named after metrological equipment. That is rope bearer, etc. So the combined signs were weight unit and volume unit are getting you know, combined. So these there are huge relationship between them. There are, they, for example, for the spitul of standard uh, of South Asia standard, that is weight-based unit, that is having this equivalency, one shake of value, that is volume-based unit of unhashed grain by volume will, is equal to one pichul weight-based weight based unit. So these kind of equivalences possibly were getting reflected in these symbols. Actually, as Arthashastra specifies, depending on the type of weight-based or volume-based or counted, the tax rates changed. So it's an important information for a tax record. So if I don't have time, I'll stop here i'll not talk about the arrow sign that is a terminal sign and this is a bit less obvious than the jar sign and load bearer sign but asian means arrow asiani means goldsmith's balance narach means arrow narachi means goldsmith's balance narachamu in telugu dictionary is have saying an arrow an instrument to cut gold goldsmith's balance so the arrow sign could have been related to precious commodity measurement and corresponding tax. Um, in another paper, which is getting peer reviewed, this is the last slide, last but one slide for me. So that is getting peer reviewed. I have got the whole Chanhu Jodaro excavation site contextualized for the inscriptions. And my theory is if the commodities names are found in seals and tablets, then the, if certain seals and tablets are found concentrated near certain craft areas, that is a huge empirical clue for decipherment, then that is possible that it, it is getting uh, those seals and tablets are talking about the raw material products or craft of the related to that workshop area. Now, if you can see the places where Mackey has, Mackey has actually showed which parts were have, of Chanhu Jaradaro were having which kind of craft. So the places where the Jamestown bead making factories were, there we can see all the orange is getting, you know, extremely, uh, you know, orange colors are very concentrated. So because of the color of carnelian, I have uh, given all the fish sign inscriptions as orange. And my theory is fish shines were some possibly related to gemstones. There are linguistic symbolism. Dravidian mean be, uh, is meaning bright, shining. From there in some Dravidian languages, mean mean or something, I think, I don't remember immediately. That means firefly, fish, and gemstone. In some Dravidian languages, mean related words are used for gemstone. In Persian, minal means gemstone. And actually, minakari, the polishing thing, if it is having some relation, I'm not sure. We have to explore. So another thing in Mesopotamia, the uh, 
H H carnelian and beads with and agate beads with eye patterns, which were exclusively coming from Indus Valley. They were called fish eye beads because fish is a serious counter witchcraft or apotropaic symbol. So there are various things. I will not go further, but this arrow symbol mostly occurs with fish and other precious commodity type symbols. You can see there are many a times occurring with fish. So that is uh, uh, one way of looking at it. I conclude my talk and thanks for listening. Thank you. Hello, 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 Dr. Ganeshan, hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, tea breaks are there. Just after uh, 10 minutes, we will come back to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank sir, you. For, uh, the, sorry for the delay. Actually, the presenter has taken uh, more time. So, yeah. We have, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, kindly have your tea also. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you.
Prakasha.
ஹலோ நான் ரெடியா சார் இருக்குது <laughs> 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 யாரும் பார்க்காத படம் ஐராவதம் ஐராவதம் எங்க கிராமத்துல இருக்கிற சில பிக்சர்ஸ் போட்டோ சரி பத்து பதினஞ்சு நிமிஷத்துல நான் முடிச்சிடுறேங்க ஐயா முடிச்சிடுறேங்க ஒன்னும் பிரச்சனை இல்லை அது ஆமா ஆமா அது தமிழர் கையில மைக் கொடுத்தா முடிக்க மாட்டாங்க நான் டென் பிப்டீன் மினிட்ஸ் முடிச்சிடுறேங்க ஐயா ஒன்னும் டோன்ட் வரி டோன்ட் வரி ஐராவதேவ <laughs> thank you can you all hear me good up ella kekudungla this is the next session um, at the outset uh, i would like to thank the authorities of uh, state archaeology and uh, my good friend sundar from uh, uh, to organize this uh, excellent uh, international conference and also i thank to the authorities for having given me the chance to chair this session the fifth session we have four papers in this uh, little bit changes we have uh, the first paper is kashi then uh, with the permission of the uh, organizers and uh, the paper reader uh, sri sidran i request ganesh is already online that's why I, we have having the paper first paper uh, from ganeshan uh, ganeshan uh, dr ganeshan is working now in nasa usa and he is advisor of still after retirement also he is continuing there as advisor and he belongs to kongri region and he has contributed more in terminology and archaeology and uh, art history and uh, he is always good friend of us all the archaeologists and uh, eminent scholars in india and abroad and he has written number of articles related to terminology and uh, tamil literature uh, welcome you sir i am rajavali speaking thank you are you hearing thank you sir thank you anna oh thank you thank you more over he is my relative also so he is calling me as anna uh, thank you very much dr ganeshan for having participated in the uh, session in my session uh, so you can continue your uh, uh, paper i don't know your paper what is the title of that they have not given so you can mention your paper and you can uh, speak okay. on that thank you can you see my screen please can you all see, see the screen yes sir we can please see. okay thank you so dr rajavel mentioned about my paper mudarkan tamil nadu tholiyal thoraikkum en nanbar dr k rajan avargalukkum roja muthaya noolagathukkum இந்த வாய்ப்பை நல்கை மிக்க மிக்க நன்றி நான் இதை ஆங்கிலத்திலேயே பேசுகிறேன் ஏனெனில் காலையில் மிக வயதானவர்கள் பார்க்க இருக்கிறார்கள் அசோகன் பர்போலா மைக்கேல் லாக்வுட் மைக்கேல் விட்சல் பிரண்டா பேக் போன்றவர்கள் இன்று இப்பொழுது பன்னிரெண்டு மணி சிலருக்கு ஆல்ரெடி ஒரு மணி ஆயிடுச்சு பாஸ்டன்ல விட்சலுக்கு so in the morning they will see the recording so let me continue in english my topic is to share some old photographs taken in the year 1955 1956 in sulakkal there is a famous mariamman temple uh, the hereditary trustee is praivalayam praivalayam kobanna mandradi you can read about them in the colin mckinsey manuscripts 
they used to catch elephants and give it to madurai nayak kings and so on many of the tamil grammatical tradis, uh, treatises were sponsored by puraivalai uh, they are called a kalandai kopanamandradi uh, there was a kodisithar there uh, living there and uh, their temple and our temple is surakal mariamman temple you might have seen that in the movie devar mahan uh, at the end of the movie and uh, n mahalingam's uh, wife is named after surakal mariam it is their kula deity also aruchalvar dr n mahalingam who was a very big sponsor of airavadam mahadevan in all his researches so uh, I, let me take just one in the sign uh, and how dr mahadevan described it and also some changes that parpola and myself have made and they are vyabaham the spread across after the harappan mature harappan period the post harappan period in the indo gangetic valley and it spread towards andhra karnataka and mainly in tamil nadu in motur udayarnatham and also in the pottery sherds uh, including keeladi from the keeladi pottery sherds have never been uh, told of this uh, so called murugu sign of dr airavadam here are some pictures uh, sri airavadam and uh, this is dr b c kulandasamy our professor and vice chancellor of the gindi engineering college Uh, which later became anna university professor vck is uh, very important in our engineering uh, education in tamil nadu he has always been called vc of vcs vice uh, his uh, initials are also vc uh, in the early 1970 i think the gindi engineering my college got the computer even though dr magalingam lost the election in 1967 uh, he uh, because you know it was uh, conducted very honestly by airavadam mahadevan he continued the friendship and sponsored him always and uh, and it was him who called both of them for a dinner in his bungalow in st mary's road and uh, arranged the computer work to be started from gindi engineering professor v c kulandaswamy uh, has started the work uh, helped uh, dr airavadam to start the work and uh, finally he became jawaharlal nehru fellow in delhi and uh, that fellowship ended still he continued and the famous concordance of indus text was published by the archaeological society of india i used to talk with airavadam for uh, over the phone for 20 plus years enga ganir korla kekliye apdinu solvaru un paatana irukken friend nu solvaru and the rendu moonu photo share pandra this is in sulakal at the school temple i think where arichal where nm is hoisting the flag and uh, looking on is airavadam mahadevan i think this was taken in 1956 on an independence day remember this was just uh, just 7 or 9 years later than the after india achieved its independence so this is a rare one my cousin solakal tangam who shared this picture is here as a small child all my relatives are standing and this is in a budan movement i don't know whether it's a budan movement he attended arijan colony openings he attended and also for the parambikulam adiyar project he was explaining how good it will be for kollachi taluk that's uh, airavadam mahadevan speaking the next one is uh, vkp vk panisam gounder and who is the father of the pap parambikulam adiyar project uh next to vkp is n mahalingam uh, sakti uh, sakti company's chairman and this is kobanamandradiya uh, poraiwadam zamindar 
and who has uh, tenner kalike singular padingide endru oru oru durai kovai irundu alindu vittathu ore oru paadal nanikkan pudakkal thuraiyile ore oru paadal maatram ninji irukirathu tiruchangodu ashtavadani uthusami konar has published the in the kongumandala sadagam in 1923 Uh, written by Karmeha Kavija, a Jain poet of Kungunad. Next, Paraiwala Mandradiyar is my great-grandfather, whom, whom, uh, about whom Airavada Mahadevan has told me many things, because I was a little child then. The, uh, on the right side is Airavada Mahadevan, speaking in the first world Tamil conference uh, in Kuala Lumpur, organized by father zavier taninayagam and he is explaining this breaking of the puhariyu uh, near karur thus established the vanji uh, vanji karur as the capital of the chera kings in sangam poetry uh, this is in a interview an interview to lalita ram where he tells that you know the his pollachi days have been have always been memorable and he is happy that he he learnt about the village culture there in coimbatore district during his tenure there he got married and uh, after that he got involved in the numismatics and also epigraphy and moved on to delhi there he became a friend of romila thapar all all his work has been inspired by c sivarama murthy that's what he told uh, sivarama murthy inspired him into this and then k v subramanian iyer was living in coimbatore and that i v subramanian iyer and uh, because uh, his son k s vaidinathan was in coimbatore for a long time pulavar rasan asked me to go and meet him once i met k v subramanian iyer's son also KVS was instrumental in telling that Tamil Brahmi inscriptions are in Tamil and uh, taking that cue and lead uh, Airavadam Mahadevan clearly established that it's all in Tamil. I enjoyed the talk by Professor A. Murugayan from Paris. Hope he gives a two hour lecture on the linguistic aspects of Tamil Brahmi inscriptions. I watched only few things. Yes, I had to go to work today. U.S. Air Force people were coming, so uh, I will listen to them uh, all the lectures tomorrow. Uh, in 1891, Professor Indologist, Sanskrit Professor at Harvard, C.R. Landman established the Harvard Oriental series, where Buddhist Buddha Jataka stories, Vedic concordance by Maurice Bloomfield. and his prestigious works of indo indo aryan you know uh, epigraphs and texts and philological texts uh, linguistic analysis have been coming but there was none from dravidian languages including tamil thanks to monumental lifetime contribution by airavadam mahadevan only in the volume 62 thanks to professor michael witzel uh, we have the early tamil epigraphy the first on tamil in the prestigious ivy league harvard o- harvard universities harvard oriental series uh, his uh, magnum opus and then even much earlier uh, the early tamil epigraphy was published in 2003 in 1977 the asi published the indus script and concordance and tables and professor La- Airavadam during his lifetime he always believed that the brahmi entered tamil nadu only after ashokan period and michael lockwood looking at other things uh, he has written two beautiful papers that are available in the academia.edu saying that uh, you know they are uh, chandragupta maurya's period ashokan's grandfather but now professor rajan yatish kumar rajesh swanantham rajit baskar's paper is very instrumental and uh, it's a key contribution man and environment just recently last year was published 
and that establishes at least by 500 BCE, we have Brahmi in Tamil Nadu. But Brahmi ought to have been uh, originated in the North India as it is designed for an Indo-Aryan language. Uh, there are several uh, scholars who have published. One of the most extensive papers on this subject is written by Michael Lockwood, Christian College, now almost 85 years. So, uh, so please read those papers and uh, let me continue and try to finish it. So let me show you, let me, by 500 or 550 BCE, if the Brahmi is found in Tamil Nadu, that has deep implications for this sculpture found by Arvin and Sanjay Manjal, which is a crocodile anthropomorphic axe uh, sculpture. That's what I believe. Even though Sanjay Manjal calls it a wild boar uh, due to art historical considerations and the side view of a real uh, crocodile, Crocodilius palustris, if you look at that, you can see the wedge on, the, on its head, on the skull above. And also there is a rim of flesh, rim of muscle around the, around the eye, which you cannot see in a, in a pig or varaha or boar. Also, the, for a pig, the, it will be a straight line in the, in the face. And uh, so looking at the art historical angle or looking at the real, uh, real wild pig, we don't find the Varaga sculptures matching with this one. This has got to do be, uh, be a crocodile as it can be easily shown by looking at the side view of the crocodiles. The important thing is there is a, there is a proto Brahmi, if you want, you can call it. There is a Brahmi written on it. I don't know, there has to be a lot of analysis to show that whether those letters were written later or it was cut, uh, uh, cast as a single piece. Eventually NASA technology and other things will decide. You know, if you have a small metallurgical analysis, eventually it will tell the time. There are some doubts uh, that are expressed by Parpola, uh, just like what he said about Sambi and Kandiyur. I am anxious to listen to Dr. Marxia Gandhi on the subject today, a little later. And, uh, but this definitely, seems to be the uh, crocodile and there is a unicorn and uh, the, the late face of the Harappan thing, the unicorn bull uh, that has a kind of blanket on the, on the top of the unicorn and both the horns are shown. And the first line seems to indicate some, some nyaka. Nya is very, very special to Dravidian. Uh, nya, a lot of North Indians cannot pronounce Nya. Uh, so Nyaka comes from Nyehul. Nyehul is the source for Nakar. Nakar is the name of the uh, Gadial, Gadial crocodile, the river crocodile eating fish that has almost 100 teeth on each side. And the same thing you can see in a beautiful Burian, burial earned pottery shirt that is an applique where art, I, I consider it is one of the masterpieces of South Indian art. Here, there is a lady with a hourglass or two inverted triangles body that we see in the Birana uh, pottery shirt also uh, that was published by T.S. Subramanian in the front line. And uh, later on, Professor Selvakumar has a paper on the rock uh, rock uh, shelter paintings. So the same structure for the girl and uh, to indicate that she is Kotri or Kotrave of Sangam, there is an antelope, uh, the Kalaiman, Karuman, or the black buck, very special to India. So there is a black buck, there is a Kotri, and uh, the paddy cultivation is there. There's a strewn pa uh, paddy, in the paddy, when it is being harvested, you can see all the coco, egrets, cattle egrets. So I, uh, the egret is shown. And approaching her is the crocodile. Her husband happens to be the pole star 
Durva Nakshatra symbol. So there is a Dampati or Jodi uh, that is shown in the original burial urn poetry. The next is, uh, this is the so-called Murugu sign. Professor Dr. Airavadam has written about this extensively <coughs> and he has called the first two signs, the first two signs in the Sembian Kandiyur cert also, the first one the leftmost to the viewer, this sign as Murugu sign. However, this could be the crocodilian sign, according to our Makara, Makara Vidangar sign, as I call it. Uh, this is a, uh, explained very well in the crocodile paper by Professor Perpola also. And we see the motor being Narsimaya found in 1970s, I think, and then Udayar Natham Vedachalam Dr. Vedachalam sir said he found the Udayarnatham. This is anthropomorphic acts according to art historian, classical art, a Greek and Roman art professor from Oxford has written that this is an anthropomorphic acts and you can see the creation mythology. This is the river crocodile uh, that's called Gadial. The locals call it in Bihar and Bengal as Nakar. And in the earlier slide, I, I showed uh, the anthropomorphic acts found by Sabdar Ali in Sonipat, Haryana, by Sanjay Manju. And this could be the Nakar. And there is a creation mythology. The lady, probably Kotri, or later Proto Durga, she leaves her fighting tigers and she mates with the crocodile. Previously, there were a lot of things that is, uh, uh, it was a plant, it was a crab, and so on. But uh, this is the crocodile that was told by uh, Philip Rawson, which I have expanded, and uh, Parpola has agreed. This is from the Parpola's book. And recently, about a year ago, I saw a beautiful picture taken by Dr. V. Vedachalam, in 4MSR site in Binjor, near Binjor in Rajasthan. And that curiously, this is, comes from a pre-Harappan mound, uh, pre-Harappan industrial site uh, uh, excavations. And this seems to be a ceramic amulet, a tayat worn across, uh, I think the, the hole in which the string is strung uh, and they put it around, the, they wore it around, across the neck. And here you can see the crocodile. Uh, of course, uh, unfortunately, the head and tail, probably which is projecting out, uh, kind of broken off. And uh, that stands for the Duru Nakshatra or the pole star. <coughs> and uh, the uh, Maluval Nedion in Madurai Kanji and uh, his, uh, his wife <coughs> or spouse, is shown by her mount or the Vahana, that is the black buck that we see in the that we see in the Adi Chandalur burial learn also. <coughs> we see a precursor or predecessor to anthropomorphic acts or Maduval Nedion in the Indo Gangetic plains about 500 800 years before. The last piece of which is the Sonipet anthropomorphic axe. <coughs> this comes from the copper hoard culture. In, and these are from B.B. Lal, <coughs> former ASA director general, and uh, about 130 anthropomorphic axe uh, sculptures in bronze have been found in the region, mainly, <coughs> mainly between Yamuna and Ganga. The other one is in Lothal. The other one, there is one in Haryana and the second one is the Sonipet. So that provides the link of the two uh, major works of Airavada Mahadevan. One is about Brahmi in Tamil Nadu. The other is about Indus script. The linking piece is the Sonipet that has the Brahmi as well as the anthropomorphic acts. Recently, how the evolution, the evolution of the anthropomorphic acts is found, I discovered in the rock paintings. The, 
the one left on the left side comes from Bimbetka, Erwin Neumeyer's book. And here you can see the Gadial crocodile, river crocodile, morphing into, morphing into a man, a human. <coughs> you can see the tail, uh, tail shortening, and also it's a phallic symbol. The river crocodile's uh, long snouted mouth becomes the phallic symbol. Here it's a beautiful transformation in the post harappan times, in the early uh, Iron Age, the Gadial transforming itself as a human, human being, a male. <coughs> the other one comes from Satkunda near Bhopal. This is found by Dr. Matpal, Padmashri Matpal. And here you can see the male crocodile without the tail. And there is an arrow. There is an arrow and there is a yoni or vulva. There is a female one. And it's a domestic scene. A couple are dancing, male and female. Uh, being a domestic scene, you can see a, a dog, domestic dog and there's a lady or a, a human being watching. So these are the <coughs> transformations of the crocodilian Makara sign from the Indus Valley in the rock paintings of India. The one to the right at the bottom is the punch-marked punch -marked, pre maurian coin found recently in the Kiladi excavations. And this has a symbolic Tantric, uh, Tantrayana symbol. There you can see the crocodile sign with a, a near a pond. And you can explain, you know, this is the Dampati, this is the crocodile, and this is the goddess. That's the Tantra aspect of it. But ordinarily, it's a crocodile and a pond. You can wonder why the, uh, I always wondered why in the punch marked coins, the pre Maurian symbol. Yeah. Hello. Uh, sorry yes. for the interruption. Uh, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let me complete. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so in the I am writing a book, and in about uh, about 100, 120 pages, I will explain all this, the uh, religious aspects of the <coughs> Makara, and also the Kotri that has the Kalaiman uh, black back as a symbol, and this is told anthropomorphic acts. This is this. The native local description is only found in the Indian, one of the India's classical languages, Madurai Kanji, Neerum, Nilamum, Tiyum, Vadiyum, Maha Visumbudu, Aindhuda Nietriya, Maduval Nidiyon, Talevan Nahe. This is a thought. This is for the anthropomorphic acts that we find in Udayarnatham and also in Motur. <laughs> This symbol repeats itself in many places. B.B. Law published it in Sanur. <coughs> Hairavadam sir published it in from Thailand. There is a crocodile sign which he called as Muruku. <coughs> and this is the Sembian Kadiur third. This is the beautiful ones from Kiladi. There are two of them. <laughs> the bottom one is a drawing published by government of Tamil Nadu in the Kiladi book. The above one was provided by Amarna, Amarna Ramayushna. You can see the crocodile sign that uh, Professor Selvakumar and Airavadam has published from Musiri and Patanam also. Mangudi also has this. So it will be very good if there is a digital database of all the pottery megalithic pottery with the graffiti and also Brahmi, everything loaded <coughs> with the time period described by archaeologists of Tamil Nadu. That will be a real boon to uh, Indus Valley research and also the megalithic religious aspects of Tamil Nadu. So with that, uh, I conclude because there is no time uh, I can go on talking and uh, uh, today my <laughs> uh, throat is not cooperating either. 
So I would like to conclude that I'm working on a, on a book that uh, shows the Indus crocodile cult and the crocodilian sign there, how it propagates through the anthropomorphic acts in the endogangetic planes and also in the rock paintings I have shown from Satkunda and also Bimbaitka and how it comes to the punch marked coins, pre-Maurian ones with the tantric symbol as a dampati, the crocodilian sign that loses its tail that we already see in the rock paintings. You know, there is no uh, tail, the tail becomes the head. And in the Atharva Veda, Atharva Veda, the, uh, the pole star is said to be the, with the he head down, uh, tail up, uh, uh, pole star is said to be the crocodile. So uh, please read the Roots of Hinduism by Asko Parpola, where he describes two waves of Aryans, a uh, small one, maybe 2%, 3%, that uh, co-opt co with the uh, Dravidian elites and form the Indus religion in the post harappan times. post harappan times. So with that, uh, we conclude and uh, much further can be read in the papers that I have published. They are all in the archive.org. I will combine all of those with the added data about the punch marked coins and also many other things. I am writing a book which probably will be published in a few months time. Thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ganesan, for your excellent paper uh, presented here. Uh, uh, since the time is running out, uh, there is no question. Uh, if they want, they can make a mail to you. Then you can clarify that. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank uh, you. Welcome. I welcome any question. Yeah, thank you. The next paper, yesterday has to be uh, read. Uh, it is omitted already. Uh, the Sunit from uh, Bhuneshwar, he is a good friend of us and good friend of our uh, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan also. <coughs> uh, as working as a deputy director for uh, Orison Institute of Maritime and Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, and uh, he discovered a number of uh, historical sites in Bhuneshwar, including uh, Ratnagiri and other sites. I visited with him uh, 25 years back and uh, I call upon uh, Sunil Kumar Bhatnaik for his excellent paper, uh, the title is Early Ports and Trade Network of the East Coast. The Ports and Trade Network on the East Coast. Uh, please. Uh, Namaskar. It's a rare, rare opportunity for me that uh, I am being invited by Tamil Nadu State Archaeology and the Rajamata Library to <clears throat> deliver, to discuss something about the cultural heritage of East Coast. Actually, at the outset, I am going to present an overview of uh, what works are being undertaken in the East Coast, in the Odishan Coast particularly. Uh, then only we will switch over to uh, maritime trade. Uh, since uh, it is uh, the whole seminar is dedicated to Iravatan Mahadevan, the great scholar, I think whatever we are doing in Odisha, that is also blessings of Iravatan Mahadevan because last 20 years I am working with uh, uh, in this field. And I'm getting blessings from our Balakishan, who is uh, one of the uh, blessed uh, disciples of uh, Aravati Mahadevan. Because I think I worked under 26 IS officers in my career. And I found only one IS officer who was, who patronized us and who, who guiding us uh, uh, in my long career. And uh, because of him, the archeological works, whatever being undertaken in Odisha, that is going on, and uh, I uh, I must uh, extend my heartful thanks to him. Uh, we have conducted a good number of uh, archaeological seminars also. Uh, this is the one place because uh, you all know because you are all the 
greatest uh, great uh, learn great archaeologist and historian uh, when bibilal excavated sushpalgarh in 1948 49 the one of the motto is that to know the extinction of harappan culture in eastern belt of india that is one of the motto and uh, by the way also another motto is to extend the ganga valley civilization up to eastern coast that is one of the motto he has written in his ancient india so but uh, uh, at the time when he excavated uh, sushpalgarh the uh, lowest lower most is thought dated to 3rd century bc and after rk mahanti and monika smith did the excavation in 2007 then it uh, extended up to 6th century bc after that series of excavations were undertaken in the east coast and we are, our motto is uh, to look the extension of uh, culture or what is the extent of culture in orisha area in eastern coast or eastern india that's why you are uh, taking some of the early, early historical sites and archaeological sites a lot of uh, archaeological sites and iron age sites recently in last two, two decades have been excavated by various scholars like pk behra of samalpur university and the some other scholar uh, and the uh, archaeological survey of india also gold by in the swabari the the chalukyathik period dates back to 21 bc or 2200 bc that is the idea of carbon date from gold by and swabari also latest excavation that is also dated up to uh, 2200 bc so th- that is our last test the extended dated site we have on the basis of that i am taking a site like this is durga devi here the site is in uh, extreme north northern side of odisha just near to bengal uh, it is very close to tamrlipi also uh, it is only 70 80 km from tamrlipi and this site is a unique feature that uh, last year we we had a one uh, uh, session excavation there you see the you see the fortification wall the yellow one this is the fortification wall and uh, these are the rivers these are two sono river and uh, one more uh, river here but uh, this is the branches of main river bulhavanga is here so uh, in the between that this is the fortification wall and the fortification runs around it is 4.9 km and uh, the state it is 1 km width so we have chosen this area for excavation why because it is gives uh, from our little bit excavation we have gone up to only 2.25 meter uh, although the depth is around 5 to 6 meter uh within that we found three phases of culture one is uh, chalcolithic and uh, followed by iron age and then early historical mostly chalcolithic period uh, culture is very much available and iron age too also here we got this is the site this is the fortification wall and this is what only 25 days we have conducted our excavation see the chalukyathi pottis painted pottis and here you see the hut round hut it is something now we are very much excited to carry out further excavation here but we are awaiting the license from is a and these are the pottis this is chalukyathi pottis where the iron is uh, iron object from durga devi and black and red ware also few number of black and red ware the perforated ware because this site is going to an eye opener for us uh, because uh, the continuation of three phases of culture and the same uh, lifestyle is being being followed in the nearby villages also the pot making this is the gudguda this is a pot making village all the villagers are pot, potters it is only 1 km from the site and the tradition is still living and uh, this is the lifestyle of a hut these are our excavated sites all along uh, odisha coast this is tamlepi here is somewhere uh, durga devi buda balanga durga devi is here then radhanagar i have also excavated this uh, early historical site this is manika patna this is kalinga patna mukhalingam and beyond andhra coast and uh, tamil coast 
Now, what the Chariens sir has uh, uh, pointed out, uh, pointed out and presented, that how Changam culture and how Patnam has, has uh, influenced or uh, have wide spectrum of culture coming down, coming from south to north. It is a culture, uh, not north south, but it's a spread of culture. That's what, like that, we found it is a culture from Radhanagar and all that. It is also spreading everywhere. And we have this kind of uh, Buddhist uh, images. This is a Buddha image, not uh, the natural or not akin to Indian art. It is something outside. And this lion is also is a, some kind of uh, Mongolian style. And these are the portraits, black and red wear, rollated wear, not wear, red sleeve wear. And these are the inscriptions. This is the Vayanagara, this is Bijay of Panchmak Vayan, and this is Seal of Tisa. So uh, this uh, Radhanagar site is also one of the most major important site and the, the latest date uh, we have submitted for scientific dating, but the uh, relative date is there around 4th century BC. What Nanda, uh, the reference in uh, Hathigam inscription, that Nanda invited uh, Kalinga. That might be something. And this is Sispalgar. And series of sites along the East Coast, you know, you will find up to Dhanyagataka uh, or up to Nagarjuna Kunda, series of every 15, 20, yeah, 40, 40, 40, 50 kilometers, you will find a uh, urban site, as well as a port site. That is the beauty of East Coast. Everywhere, like uh, Satwaha Patha from Nasik to Kaveri Patna, you will find a series of caves uh, here, Satwaha in the West Coast. Here in East Coast, this, this, this is being <clears throat> proved recently, because the, all these excavations are done only uh, uh, last two decades. One or two days, uh, uh, yeah, within two decades, except this forward. So now the these are the Lati, Jogoda, all are in a series. This is Kalingapatnam port. Uh, here we have uh, uh, one of the prejudice in our mind that in uh, when while you working in Odisha and Odishan area, there is a benchmark, the Kalingova in T261 BC. Most of the scholars, those who have worked, they are they are not willing to go beyond Kalingova because they they think that the, our lifestyle, our state of state and society started from Mauryan period only. For that purpose, we have also taken up series of descriptions and very well it goes beyond that. It is goes up to 6th century BC right now. And uh, there is a prejudice and uh, very few descriptions conducted so far. The, and uh, this is Dantapura. Uh, this is related to Palur also because uh, <clears throat> this is the Dantapura site. It is excavated by little bit. It is the one session excavation conducted by state archaeology in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, this is Shalihundam. This is Banshadhara. All these three sites, the beauty is that all the three sites in a row, only within 10, 20 kilometers, you will find Kalingapatna on the, <clears throat> on the sea coast. Just after uh, six kilometers, you will find Shalihundam. After seven kilometers, we will find Dantapura settlement site. This is a very good uh, study of urbanization in uh, East Coast. Likewise, the, here the um, uh, Radhanagar is also like that. There is a cluster, and Sishpalagar is also like that. Sishpalagar is very close to Daya River, and there is a, a number of five hills are there and dominated by Buddhist monasteries and Buddhist stupas. That is again uh, gives us a very good picture of urbanization in uh, third, fourth century uh, BC onwards. Then coming down to coastal landscape with Karamandal and all that, uh, Gunpali. East Coast is actually literally the whole thing. Now we have to, I have to ask, I have to request Jadian sir to help us to, <laughs> to make our data, to interpret our data with uh, your data, Panam, uh, Patnam. Long back, one of my friend, uh, Ajahn, he was, he was working there, he was my friend. He sent me some data also. So, <clears throat> Uh, so now we have to work more to uh, correlate our data so that our actually history, our history could be exposed. <clears throat> then uh, maritime trade, you know, all these, uh, it is very well described in Periculus and uh, uh, Starbo and the Tormi, all that. They have given uh, descriptions about Palur, about the ports of uh, all, uh, you know, India, East Coast, you know, as well as West Coast. And after that, the, now our point is that we have to we have documented many things from Tamlipi to uh, 
Tamlip T2, Krishna River. The lower Ganga to Krishna River, we have documented, physically we have documented, and the data are with, with us. And we have to go beyond that, from Krishna to Kaveri. That much uh, you people are doing, so that uh, you can <coughs> collaborate all the data, and uh, they will take uh, forward. And fortunately, uh, Sarva was telling that uh, Tamil Nadu State actually is willing to take away excavation in Palu. And uh, Palu is, uh, I will go to that. These are the references, whatever found uh, from the, all these sites. And there's a beauty is that everywhere you will find Buddhist monasteries or some kind of settlements there all along East Coast, up to Nagipatnam. And Nagipatnam bronzes are heavy, having some kind of similarity with our bronzes. What find we have found around 200 bronzes from Achutra's school. It is near Palur. Uh, that is a uh, Shailadhava kingdom and it is a Congo though. The name is Congo though. The area is still, uh, the archaeology say, archaeological remains are there. Uh, so up to Nagipatnam, we have close connection. And from Nagipatnam, we have close connection to Patnam. So whole thing is in a circuit network now. So this is Travel uh, routes of Periplus. And this is the K route, and it is based. Uh, the iron that I don't know, I have extended from here to here this route because almost all the scholars they come Uttarabhatana, Uttarabhatha, Dakinabhatha everywhere, and they ended it Tamil, uh, this Tamil uh, Last year in one of the seminars, uh, because uh, we have our continuation uh, with archaeological fields. Even the DK Chakravarti and Romila Thapar everywhere. Dr. Sunil, they mentioned about it, but they have stopped here. Dr. Sunil, uh, yeah. time is ending. So this uh, trade route now, Purviya Pathayad, or the eastern trade route, Pachyo, Pachyo, this Amaravati is linked to Amaravati because uh, if you find uh, the travel of history in archaeological way, you can find the growth of development, growth and development of uh, you know uh, monastic sites and uh, Buddhist art also. It's a close link with Amaravati and Nagarjuna Kunda and the reference of Nagarjuna Kunda uh, inscription about the Palur and the uh, Purishan sites. Even Kharavela, uh, <coughs> so reference in Hatigumpata, line 13, inscription uh, reference about procure of pearl from Pandyan country in 1st century BC. That is one of the uh, another, you know, uh, linkage, trade linkage, yeah, uh, cultural linkage with Pandyan country uh, around the Madurai. So, <coughs> That is on a, all references available with us. The thing is that we have to combine it, and we have to because uh, there are little, uh, there are very few scholars are working, and uh, we are lack of uh, human resources. Anyway, uh, we, now we are getting a good platform. So these are the trading centers uh, because Bangladesh scholars they were working in Mahasan and other they came to us, they presented uh, this thing. They have excavated also. Stella is also working here. So. <clears throat> So uh, the trading network of East Coast is uh, very good. Uh, it gives us a good, uh, you know, uh, platform. These are the uh, uh, excavated finds from Tamilipti. Just I uh, skip it in Manikapatna. Manikapatna is on Puri coast. Uh, it is around just uh, near Palur. Uh, this Chinese coin and Shilonese coins and this uh, <coughs> bronzes from Indonesia, all are Available, we got it. Uh, our institute has uh, excavated it in the forest inscription. This is Indonesian bronze, Ampore, and in Indonesian terracotta also. So uh, then Kolkata Patna is near Kona. Here it is a uh, late period, it is a, the, it's a port site, but it is 13th century port site. Lot of porcelains, and uh, uh, we are getting a lot of porcelain. You know, it is excavated by Archaeological Society of India by BK Sinha. Then Kalingam Patna again on the same line. Uh, the stupa site, these are the sites, and uh, uh, again it's a Vishakhapatna. Vishakhapatna was known as a city, as a port of uh, uh, established by Kulatunga, a uh, 10th century AD, till now. But now, after coming of this Thatlakonda and Bhavikonda uh, excavations, it gives uh, much more light, much more light, uh, and it extended uh, as a port up to Satavan period and uh, 4th century BC also. Uh, it is reported by Andhra Pradesh. Uh, state archaeology department report and i have seen also there these are these two parts and uh, uh, monasteries in thatlakona near vijayapatna then role of buddhism uh, to connect all this culture from north to south or uh, north from east to south and south to north again 
it was a network it gives the evidences this is all the maritime evidences reflected in temple walls and some buddhist sites this is konak martan bhairav these are the temples and this is jagannath temple uh, boat motif so they again sites this is the tate network nothing to say about you because you know all these things uh, here we got some graffiti mark here this is not a decipher this is from radhanagar these are the uh, excavated materials this is mahendragiri another benchmark in this course which was referred by many of the scholar and this is the tate network vatipallu is being referred as a city of pithundo referred in hathigum inscription and it is guntupalli Uh, because it is a part of his coast and a part of continuation of trade and uh, uh, culture these are the sites up to kanchipuram also it was a port again earlier it was a buddhist site and yeah again uh, just little bit about parlo parlo it is being referred uh, by talmi and uh, it is just uh, on the national highway Uh, near Barampur in Ganjam district. It's a small village now, but in the adjoining uh, just on the uh, Chilka Lake here. This is Palur. Manika Patna is here, and Goranga Patna we have excavated this site also uh, two years back. Uh, uh, only one or uh, two uh, culture uh, periods we found. Here is a small site. And this is Bangkara Gaur and Banpur. This is Congo. The where we got a number of bronzes, which are similar to Nagi Patna and in Indian Bronze. Bronze is also. So this is a uh, area. It's a capital area. Sailor Dhobal. They ruled here around two hundred years, five fifty to around uh, um, uh, yeah five fifty to six fifty nine. Yeah, it is more than more than hundred years. They have left us a good number of you know uh, temples because the, the temple art started with these people. Uh, here in Odisha region in 6th century AD uh, here is parlor it is only 20 uh, 20 km from here to here uh, so uh, this is the area where uh, we wanted to have excavation because it is, it is mentioned that talmi has selected this place for for drawing the mapping maps for the whole of india all of india this is parlor this is ilkale and this is achutapur and vankaragar these are the area where archaeological remains are available right now And uh, nearby Nepal, um, these are the urban sites, Lathi and Jogar, uh, just close to. It is only ten fifteen kilometer from here, Nepal. Two urban centers. These are the remains of uh, Chutras for Sela Dhawa uh, period. This is the uh, bronzes, and this is all about uh, the East Coast and uh, the our assimilation of culture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you for your excellent paper. Uh, Dr. Suni covers almost all the entire uh, the South Indian Eastern Coast, uh, with special reference to Odisha. Uh, when you show that uh, the uh, Sloan Man type one kind, I've seen that. Uh, I remember I read the Magadhan has written an uh, article, uh, one article on Rajendra Chola kind from Odisha. It, it is published already. <laughs> no kind also. That is seal. Yeah, that is seal. And that, yeah, that is a seal. Yeah. So uh, it's a very nice paper. Uh, since the time is very short, uh, as usual, we uh, pass on to next paper. <laughs> From paper we can account, but in another paper is also there. I think that will be in next session. Uh, now I call upon India or or Sir Lokmar, Sri Dhan Sir, sorry, Sri Dhan, Dr. Sri Dhan Sir. Uh, he is our senior. Um, yes. Uh, Uh, studied in uh, Madras University and also. <laughs> so he he was a deputy director for uh, uh, in uh, uh, that state archaeology, and he has contributed uh, uh, towards archaeology excavations and also. Many uh, discovery of many temples, uh, particularly the uh, Swarama Devi. Thank you. Uh, 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 I call upon uh, 
ஸ்ரீ ஸ்ரீதரன் ஒரு <laughs> 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 Uh, and a uh, star mark of uh, neolithic culture in modur um, actually it is a neolithic site and as well as megalithic and yet historical site also we find lot of antiquities from there and stone implements lot of stone implements are found in that uh, site <coughs> the actually uh, in tamil nadu the excavations conducted in places like payamballi in 1964 and 65 it is a, a landmark in our uh, tamil history uh, 1967 and 68 by dr s r rao mailadum pare by dr rajan in 2003 mallapadi guttur mullikad togarappalli odugattur and modur in dharmapuri district Modur is about 15 kilometers uh, from uh, Dharmaburi town and so many historical sites in and around my lord uh, Modur actually it is called Modur in Tamil literature in, then only it called as Modur now it is called as Modur in 1989 the uh, site was explored by Dr Rajan and uh, S Selvaraj and T Subramaniam of uh, state department of archaeology and so many sites in and i have mentioned this panayakulam valavadi kolagathur kadagathur and bikanahalli panayakulam was excavated in a trail excavation was conducted in 1780 myself and uh, dr shantalingam was uh, in charge for that uh, excavation but uh, this excavation how is important in for the tamil uh, history and uh, tamil neolithic culture this excavation uh, yielded about more than 150 stone implements more than 17 neolithic cells so we have uh, um, planned to, we have um, excavated that site um, i want to show that the slides no this is the um, payamballi so most of them in 1967 and 69 this excavated by uh, archaeological survey of india uh, next sorry this is the payamballi black and white in those period this is the foot hill of that payamballi uh, hill this is collected from the archaeological survey of india this photographs this is the neolithic layer actually this is the place where the dwelling pit was found because that's the first excavation conducted by the archaeology in in tamil nadu that is a neolithic period uh this is the dwelling pit and afterwards in mailadu mailadu pare that is chanur karuvattu pallam that is the uh, dwelling pit was also exposed and modur also we have uh, excavated the dwelling pit also this is the later period historical period uh, but you must uh, see this uh, ram it's a very important one this one and uh, the uh, ancient history and archaeological department uh, university of madras recently uh, 2009 they have 2020 uh, they have excavated near valasai a village near vellu uh, and uh, professor soundarajan is also here uh, he has given that uh, photographs here that uh, ash mound was exposed here the first time in because ash mound is uh, available lot in andhra pradesh and karnataka but in tamil nadu this is the first place we have they have exposed this ash mound this is the site this is the ash mound 
the students are working there the, from the University of Madras Archaeological Department. See some of the Neolithic uh, this pottery, burnished brown ware, tan ware, and uh, other things they have collected from that uh, Valasai. Also, this a uh, painted ware. It's all handmade pottery. You know, Neolithic revolution is very important. They are making uh, agriculture. They are stayed in one place and they lived in uh, in a uh, uh, house, tortured house. That is the Neolithic. So, in, in uh, the history of mankind tells that it is a, a Neolithic revolution. <coughs> this is the Modur. They are. Uh, this is the Modur here, Panayakulam here. So many sites are there in that is in uh, Dharmapuri, Palakkod, Harur, and other sites are more important for Neolithic will. Now, Dr. Rajan has took up a study of the Neolithic culture in Dharmapuri area. They have the State Department of Archaeology organizing a program now. This is the Modur site. Trenches, 15 trenches are laid there. Still, we have to do more work on this. This is the cells, 17 shells, grinding stones, vessels, spheroid rubbers, stone rubber. This grooved stone is a very important uh, for the Neolithic period. Here. Here. When I visited uh, Minneapolis, I have visited a museum there. They have placed uh, the same kind of antiquities there. There's a Neolithic cells and sharpening stones, grinding stones, oval discoids. It is used for grounding the floor in Neolithic period. This is the grooved hammers and pezzles, uh, spheroid rubbers and stone rubbers, sling stones, round discs used for the keeping the, the uh, under the wooden fillers in the uh, uh, dueling pit. This is the first time that uh, stone discs uh, are uh, available here. And uh, sling stones that is used for uh, the kavangal, like that uh, they are using that uh, sling stones. Stone hip hops. Generally, we find that uh, terracotta made up of pot shirts. Now, here the stones hip hops. This mother goddess. So, the beaked uh, face, it looks like uh, the painting Silvale. Uh, same figure is available there also. This is a mother goddess in the historical period. In megalithic period, we find uh, as usual graffiti for shirts. The spindle walls, smoking pipes, ear lobes, and other things. Still, if you go to, especially Salem, Krishnagiri, Vellur, so many so districts, if you go there in a village, it's called Mandru. Mandu. They, they call it as a Mandu. As a Mandru, this is a meeting place. If there is a temple, you find this Neolithic cell still being worshipped there. So it is a very interesting uh, district to be studied further. And Dr. Narsamaya and so many people have worked there. So, uh, and uh, this department is also going to organize a, a, a program in the Neolithic site of uh, Dharma uh, Pungu region. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your excellent paper. Actually, uh, we have not concentrated much on the Chalkulathic uh, culture in Tamil Nadu. Uh, when I visited, uh, along with uh, Sundara, the famous uh, archaeologist from Karnataka, um, the Apukalu is uh, done by Rajan and Dayalan under K.V. Ramesh, K.V. Raman. He said that it is associated with the Neolithic, uh, that is Chalkulathic, because uh, we found some... Uh, a copper uh, antenna sword in that later on. So he said that definitely you would have uh, come across some chocolate features in North Arkad and Dharmapur district. So your paper, uh, I think it enlightened to do further uh, uh, research on these aspects. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now I call upon uh, Dr. Selo Kumar. He's on online. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Selo Kumar has worked with us uh, in Tamil University as associate professor. Yes, uh, uh, he has to <laughs> complete uh, within 15 minutes. Uh, uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, Hello, Kumar, you can start. 
Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. You can start. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Department of uh, Archaeology uh, and uh, Professor Rajan and uh, Rajavelu for this uh, invitation to this particular seminar. Uh, remembering I, Professor uh, Ayravada Mahadevan, he has done immense contribution for the study of early Tamil epigraphy. So I, I will uh, get into my presentation. Uh, mainly I have uh, 60 uh, PowerPoint slides. I will just highlight the key points here within 15 minutes. Uh, you are waiting for lunch. I will not take uh, much of your time. So my presentation is about Tamil Brahmi inscriptions and the settlement patterns of uh, Tamilaham. Uh, and uh, one second. Yeah. Uh, so uh, coming to this Neolithic, already uh, uh, Dr. Sridharan made a presentation on the uh, Neolithic from Modur. Coming to the late uh, prehistoric period of Tamil Nadu, mainly Neolithic and Iron Age and early historic, uh, main, uh, we have not uh, done enough research, I feel. We need more research on the pre-Sangam age uh, foundations of Tamil country. Uh, and also Neolithic culture needs to be uh, explored more. Similarly, Iron Age culture also needs to be dated. Fortunately, now they have uh, uh, you know, uh, dated many uh, sites in Tamil Nadu. We have early date for Shiva Kalai and uh, Professor Rajan has published a paper in uh, Man and Environment which highlights uh, uh, research uh, done recently uh, taking the Iron Age possibly into the second millennium BC. Uh, but there are several areas where we need to do further research and early historic now we can bracket within 500 BCE to 300 CE, but we need more uh, research on this particular uh, phase. Coming to the early historic phase, uh, we, uh, we know that there was definitely urbanization introduction of script, introduction of coins and related ware and other uh, uh, materials and as uh, known from uh, many of these uh, sites. Uh, and uh, coming to this uh, early historic period, we need to, uh, we cannot uh, divide into two or three phases. When exactly script appeared? Uh, script may have appeared uh, at first. And when exactly the long distance connections? If you look at the evidence from um, Archimedo or uh, all the other sites, there is a clear um, indication of the long distance evidence occurring from first century BC, mainly Amphora. So that should be taken as a separate phase. First century BC should be a separate phase. But whereas a related where pre might predate this first century BC, as found in the Patanam, which Professor Cherian will talk today, I guess. In that site, we have evidence for West Asian connection predating the arrival of Amphora, uh, somewhat similar to what Wheeler found at Arikimedu uh, in the pre related where phase. So we need to basically look, uh, classify these early historic into three, four phases. That is what I have seen when I have done it here, mainly from first century BC, only the long distance trade boosts up. In fact, there was long distance trade even in 1300 BC, as we know from the evidence of Ramses II's, uh, um, you know, nostril, they found peppercorn, which they think came from India. Similarly, there is evidence of cinnamaldehyde on ceramic residue from Israel reported by Devori Namda. So definitely there is evidence. And uh, after second century CE also, we should not think of uh, dispersal. Uh, we should not think of urban decline. Rather, what I would say uh, is that urban uh, disintegration and uh, these industries moving into smaller uh, areas. Normally, we, we tend to think uh, this uh, third century CE and afterwards as a dark age. I think this is probably some misconception. What I see is in the coastal settlements, uh, we have uh, some evidences uh, coming up, but at the same time, settlements continues in third, fourth, fifth century in many of the inland towns like Kanchipuram, Urayur and Madurai. So we need to undertake more excavations there. So we need to, uh, the main idea is that we need to divide this early historic into multiple periods. Coming to 
to the attributes of early historic, I just want to quickly highlight uh, this material, Tamil Brahmi inscription, research coated, painted bear, rouleted bear, amphora, terra sigillata, Roman coins, Roman jewelry, lapis lazuli ornaments occurring. Uh, and uh, we can conceive early historic settlement units as urban centers, large uh, town, uh, coastal areas as reported by Periplus. And then we have regional centers. We have villages, small settlements, burial sites, hero stones, and spots associated with heroes, rock shelters, and trade routes. So coming to this uh, uh, Tamil Brahmi inscriptions and Tamil Brahmi script evidence, we have cave shelters, hero stones, and portable objects like rings and coins, pottery vessels, dishes, uh, and uh, you know mainly on amphora uh, and also on jars. So this one is from Arahan Kulam. Uh, this reads Chamutaka, and we, uh, according to the latest survey by Rajan, we, uh, we have about uh, you know 79 sites yielding 1571 number of uh, uh, Tamil Brahmi inscriptions, including pottery, and the pottery is found in 1461 number at 41 sites. This number I think will keep changing constantly. So uh, definitely uh, there is a higher concentration of these. Uh, uh, shirts in different uh, sites. Uh, these are some of the sites where we have uh, uh, these uh, uh, sites excavated, where we have Brahmi. Uh, and this map shows the early historic uh, hinterland sites and coastal sites. And uh, apart from India, we also have this uh, uh, Tamil. Uh, reported in Oman and Kusir al Khadim, we have Kanan Chathan uh, and also Panaivori, Fukotong, Thailand, we have uh, and also this uh, gold uh, uh, touchstone and Tisa Maharama, we have uh, this Trela Muri. Uh, and uh, coming to Arikamidu, we have interesting pattern where we have, if you analyze the names, we get to various segments like father name probably and, and son and clan mark as a symbol. Uh, so we get such a pattern uh, in many of these sites i'll not take much of your time you will you know very much uh, uh, familiar you are very much familiar with these finds uh, from these sites uh, so if we analyze uh, these uh, expression of uh, these names you find some claim name and individual name Sometimes uh, you have uh, father name, individual name, clan name as a pictorial uh, graffiti. So this pattern is interesting, especially what we have at Tukudumanal. We have see uh, this particular case, Samban, Sumanan and clan mark uh, and ownership and vessel name sometime occurs like we have Kannandai Kiran. So this is probably a clan name, which is also reported in medieval inscription in Chola country as well as in uh, uh, Kungu country. Coming to the settlements of uh, Tamil Nadu, we have at least three, four categories of settlement. As I said, we have a category one, like what uh, Papina and Bati, we found two related bear shirts and uh, two Brahmi shirts from this site. It is located in a remote area, but still it was connected with the network. This is the excavation that we did. And and this is what I call as Belir sites, like Ambal, where we have excavated, we have a uh, dating of science century BC, we have evidence of a Padal Petras Salam, Naharam, Nod, all emerging such centers, I call them as category B. Interestingly, if you compare the pattern of settlement, you see wherever there are Devara Salams, there is uh, uh, evidence of Iron Age settlement, Padal Petras Salam, and they are also uh, centers of Nadu. Uh, and uh, uh, they are also mentioned in Sangam age. Uh, this is the pattern that we see. Uh, so definitely there is some cluster. This is again in Angur where we have evidence of a Vaishnava Divya Desastalam. And this site also we have a dating of second century BC. But and, uh, we don't have much uh, uh, ceramic uh, uh, inscription, Tamil Brahmi inscription. These sites at Ambal, we found just one piece. And coming to this category three sites like Kiradi, Urayur, and they are an important site like Kodumanal. Uh, they are called urban centers. This is where we find a large number of uh, uh, these uh, Brahmi inscriptions. So definitely there is a pattern here. And coming to the components of a rock shelter, we get several terms like Adhikthana. Karantai uh, and Kavi, you know, different terms, how these people were calling this, uh, these caves, 
ponds and other features, we also get evidence of settlements like Venni, Tenur, Kapiur, Akarur, uh, Vellarai, uh, Nelveli, all that occurs in the inscription and uh, many settlements are referred to. We also have reference to hills uh, and these rock shelters, interestingly, what we find is there is an evidence of continuity uh, in occupation. Some of the rock shelters, we get paintings as well as microlus. So definitely these rock shelters, which, which were occupied by the Sramana monks, were also used by the microlithic people. And they also have Sunai and uh, sometimes we also get black and red ware. This is a very important point that there is a continuous use of this particular uh, uh, space and coming to this uh, idea you know why you are finding a lot of uh, Tamil Brahmi inscription on pottery in Tamil Nadu why not in other place if you take the case of uh, uh, Kerala we don't have so what I think is apart from ownership and identification script was used as a visual expression as a symbol apart from the inducement of in, uh, for involvement in Dhamma activities endowment activities uh, for this they were using script so that so and so donated so they found a kind of delight in their name being disseminated and it was considered as a reward for people who would be donating. So uh, it is also used for sacrifice for social cause, hero stone, Puliman Kompai and Tadapati and social status was expressed through the construction of megalithic burials, we know very well why different types were used. So here, clearly, these people are using uh, their personal identity. So personal and clan identity is, was displayed in the Iron Age using graffiti. The same idea was adopted in the early historic period. So in the arts, you see extensively at Kodumanal. So expression of individual identity and personal name and also kinship relation and clan affiliation on material object. So expression of clan or group identity was conveyed through megalithic graffiti. So what I see is this was a continuity of the tradition of the megalithic period. These people started writing their name apart from uh, the purpose of ownership, identification and inducement for uh, involvement in Dhamma and social uh, sacrifice for social uh, cause. So when you look at uh, this uh, distribution pattern, you see that the Brahmi shirts are found, the Tamil Brahmi shirts are found everywhere, but actually they are not. If you look at the, if you take the number of heli historic sites, I'm still uh, documenting there are more than a th a thousand sites. So the only 44 sites with the habitation have produced. Only, one, only some of the sites have produced more than 10 in number. For example, Patanam in Kerala, we don't have. So definitely it indicates the kind of social expression that existed in the Iron Age that was adopted in the early historic time and people started writing, conveying their identity. And def, uh, we find these, uh, their concentration around Madurai because they are all associated with the rock shelters and they are mostly associated with the trade and commercial center. So this pattern is very clear and they are sometimes the shelters are uh, aligned along the trade route and ports and uh, markets. So uh, we, although we see a widespread uh, use of writing, Tamil Brahmi on various media, but they are limited to certain settlements and certain groups of people. And it was perceived as a kind of status and prestige symbol script was used as a design as a kind of visual expression of the status and knowledge and popularity so we see the clustering of uh, inscription in the major center and mainly industrial and trade centers so this is the pattern that we see and they are not found everywhere they are confined to certain settlements more uh, often i know no, that is an imp important point here. So it is also meant for public display of donor and donee names. And it, in a way, it encouraged many people to donate. And also it was meant for some kind of communication. And we clearly see a pattern of overlap with, between these two. So these are the, some of the points that I wanted to raise here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Selva Kumar, for your uh, excellent uh, paper on Tamil Brahmi inscription and settlement patterns of early. Uh, within this, uh, we have completed our uh, papers. Uh, one more paper is there. Uh, Dr. Vaida Chalam is going to uh, in another session, next session, after uh, uh, finishing our uh, lunch. It is available in the outside. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, kind patience. And uh, also, I thank the authorities for having given me the chance to chair the session. Thank you.
it's a time to give a moment to, to the presenters i would request dr dialan to come forward to give a moment to professor vijay chirian professor vijay chirian now i request bagata anshmali mahabadhyaya now i would request uh, dr makshi gandhi to make a pre presentation of the moment to to dr s rajvelu oh sunil kumar oh, first first is sunil kumar sunil kumar patnaik please i would request uh, dr rajagopal to a presentation to the k sridhar thank you thank you very much we will dispose for our lunch and we will meet again by 230 sharply yep ah very pertinent questions uh, raised by professor chandrarajan regarding why you are neglecting a one institution totally for not not making a presentation here we thought that we, there is the uh, paper is related to uh, tamil brahmi and also related to indus script we thought that uh, none of the scholars from madras university at the moment are not uh, dealing on that particular subject and we we are planning for another uh, seminar in which we are definitely we are going to give a beautiful representation to the entire faculty members of the madras university when it is coming related to the excavation program because you have done what i say excavation but regarding to the student invitation and we are that uh, tamil nadu state archaeology department is having a 50 students in the post graduate diploma in epigraphy and archaeology and also we have invited other scholars but next time we will rectify this error on the things that is happened today because he has raised a very pertinent question very important for us as far as the tamil nadu state archaeology department is concerned we want all the senior scholars knowledge to percolate to the younger generation so that way we will not neglect you and very very thankful for you to you for coming forward to raise this important question we once again we thank and from next time onwards the invitation will be extended to the madras university to take participate in all our seminars thank you very much